Tendai Moyo. Tendai Moyo, eh, eh, I understand I, I, you, you registered way back. You registered way back. And I feel honored to, 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 to teach you, and I'm impressed by your patience because I was told you to wait until say starts the lectures. So that's perfect. Um, you know, F FM is a very easy subject, very easy. It's figure, it's a figurative subject. This, you know, subjects which are figure, which are calculations heavy, uh, are subjects which you, I would advise you to pursue if you, if, 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 you, if, 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 if you want to save time and to make your, <laughs> your life easy for yourself. You know, that, those are my subjects. No wonder why I teach them. They don't give me stress and everything. So to that end, you are right on track and you have made a good decision by choosing FM. Because it's merely some few calculations and some few commenting, and there you go. We, we want you to make a finance manager. No wonder why we call it financial management. It's a discipline which is different from accounting. Please know that it's a discipline which is totally different from accounting. Um, allow me to share my screen for a little bit. I want to, sh to, to, to take you through the, the program of study, the program of study. Uh, let me, let me, let me, let me show you how this, how we are going to discuss this particular subject, financial management. So here you go. <clears throat> right. Whilst the program of study is opening, allow me also to share, to share it on our share it on our uh, Skype on our Skype chat. I'm sending the program of study on our Skype chat. You may say say what is the program of study? Program of study details topics and the order in which we are going to discuss them. And with that with the program of study you now have and you are now informed and you can now practice and you can now do questions in the revision kit and stuff. So there you go. I'm sure this thing is open or it's about open. Okay. It's opening. So there you go. As your tutor, I am Mr. Mpati. And here are the topics. Just imagine the, 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 the syllabus only has seven topics. Seven topics which are being covered in seven weeks. So we are writing our exams in September and we have got seven weeks to cover these. Some of the topics I, 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 uh, we want to compress these to the last week of July. Last week of July, we should be done with the syllabus so that we have the entire month of August doing revision. That is the objective. As you can see, the, so the program of study details the order in which we are going to discuss these topics: investment appraisal, cost of capital, business valuations, sources of finance. Uh, capital market, capital and money markets, working capital management, currents and risk management, capital structure and dividend policy. And then we have questions that we'll be discussing. So most of the questions will be, I'll be sending you discussion material on CBE practice platform. You know, the, the CBE practice uh, platform because your exams in most instances is computer-based and also we are now learning online. So when you are learning online, the manner in which you submit assignments should also be online. Some of the assignments, I will be giving you quick assignments where you can just work them on Excel and submit on my, to my WhatsApp inbox. But structured assignments are already given, are already available on your CBE practice platform. So our administration has already enrolled you on the, on the platform. So you'll be receiving email from the platform on the assignments that we have allocated to you with the specific due dates as we cover the syllabus. Um, that, that's it. Another thing is the notes. I gave, I sent you the notes last week, which is FM notes by Mr. Patsy. These are the notes I, I, I typed, personally typed. They cover everything that you shall come across in the exam. So don't worry, you are well, kept, you are well covered in that particular respect. Uh, and the password to open the notes password to open the notes is 05 2005 AR. 
So there you go. That's the password to open the notes. Uh, but as you as 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 you say, so you may say say you have given us the notes. So what is it that we will actually be doing in class? What we are what we are actually doing now is explanations of those notes. So I would expect you to be jotting down some notes as well because for active engagement, as you are as we as we are as you are listening in class, jot down some notes because I'm explaining the notes that I've already given you. So this will work actually for everyone's uh, uh, benefit. Okay, we have got the new guest. Who is that? My name is Mr. Mpazi. You are welcome. Who is that? Uh, it is Sunboy Kamuka. Yeah, okay, uh, Sunbel, Sunboy, I, 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 I welcome you. Um, Thank you. The subject is, is, is FM, right? Yes, yes. Yes, oh, that's cool. How, 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 did it, how, how is it you come to know about Atlet Sunboy? Uh, through a friend, a reference from a friend. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And the and in here, those are your wonderful colleagues. So as you can mm -hmm. see, the lecture is being recorded. So we are six minutes into the lecture, and what I have said it's already recorded. So after the lecture, you will receive copy of the recording. Okay. Um, you receive copy of the of the recording. All other lectures which you may need, they are on. But the, they cover past exam, past classes though, not this class. But you can equally use them for, for your exam practice. They are on my YouTube uh, platform. So you, you, my YouTube channel, you can subscribe to that. It's Colin Mpaz, Colin with double L. You can still subscribe to that and play those. You keep yourself informed on various aspects of financial management. The beauty of online learning is lectures are recorded. So you can play over and over or you can even play in your car the videos. You can choose a topic, download the video, put it on your USB, play it in your car whilst you are driving, and it, 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 it has got remarkable convenience in that regard. Okay, so um, I have given you a program of study, and on the program of study, our first topic is investment appraisal. And down here, if you are seeing my screen, the, on the bottom right, I, as I have showed you, top left, the lecture is being recorded. Bottom right here, there are some interactive plugins because it's, it's, it's an interactive lecture. So bottom right, there is chat button. This is the chat button where you can type questions and you can a a answer your say. Suppose you say the answer is dividend. Suppose we are discussing and you are still typing. The answer is dividend. So you press enter i can still quote your answer like this and i can quote your answer if it is correct i say correct if i need to comment it i, I comment on it and 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 there's a react button the react button here helps you to give instant reaction suppose i say are you getting it you you can't unmute and say yes say you can just put a thumbs up sign to say it. it's, it's quite cool if you i can click it like this you know, it's popping up. You can, you can, you can, if you are loving it, <laughs> it is, if you are loving it. So there you go. And then you can raise the end, especially if you are using the mobile, the laptop version of Skype, you can raise the end. Are you seeing the raise the end button? Can you click, click on it for me to see if you are seeing it? Anyone seeing the raise the end button? Perfect. So, okay. Oh, fantastic. So this is the raise the end button. If, 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 if I say, please raise the end, you can raise your end yeah, so that I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can talk to you. So if you have raised your end, if you want to lower it, you click the same button to lower it. Uh, so this is, uh, these are basically housekeeping issues. The, so the lecture will be recorded and delivered to this class, not to your individual inboxes. It will be delivered on Skype to this class. But once the lecture is delivered on Skype, it's merely available for just 30 days and your exam is in three months time. So in mitigation, we then stream the same lecture or upload it to my YouTube account. So I will be sending you the YouTube link for the same lecture. YouTube provides a permanent record for the video. So that's, that's, that's a very good. So once you receive the link and you are playing the, the, the you are replaying the lecture, remember to subscribe again to that YouTube so that you keep yourself updated with any new videos. Okay, 
Uh, back to basics, investment appraisal. Investment appraisal. So let me open the Excel document for our first topic. Please don't worry, you have your say. You have done your part. And that's all you needed to get to your say. And now you have it. Investment appraisal. So where are we? Why investment appraisal? Because on our program of study, this is our first topic. So when you are practicing questions and doing a lot, all sorts of things, follow the the, the steps in our program of study. It, there's, there's something I, I equally wanted to send to you, which is revision kit. Let me send you the revision kit. I'm sending it again on our Skype chat here. You can as well access it there. Uh, revision kit. I will give you the latest television kit for now because uh, it's my it, 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 it's it's on my warm computer. But this one is equally cool to use for our practice. Revision kit has got questions. So if I say investment appraisal, you need to jump to questions on investment appraisal. They might not be the first questions in the revision kit. You have to scroll down the revision kit until you get to questions on investment appraisal. You get that. Okay, uh, so let us get started. Allow me to, to delete some of the. Allow me to delete some of some of some of the information here so that I make my workspace lean. You know, to make your workspace lean is to ensure that you don't have information overload on your screen, which can end up confusing investment appraisal so all right but in uh, ah, okay let me come to investment appraisal uh, after say 30 minutes let's say financial management overview financial management overview we want to introduce each other to what financial management is about so first first discussion item is objective of financial management. Objective of financial management. What is if you are a financial manager, what is it really that you are doing? What's what's your objective? What's the objective for your job as a financial manager? It's a very important question. Because it distinguishes a financial manager from accountants and stuff. So the main objective of financial management is to maximize shareholder wealth. You know, that's your main objective, to maximize, maximize shareholder, to maximize shareholder wealth. Main objective as a finance manager is to maximize shareholder wealth. Now you may say, say, why? Shareholder wealth. Why are why are you not saying share? What are why are you not saying to maximize profit? The issue is wealth maximization is different from profit maximization because wealth maximization is long term, whereas profit maximization is short term. You know that wealth wealth maximization is long term long term whereas whereas profit maximization profit maximization is short term wealth maximization is long term and profit maximization is short term so shareholders they invest money for the long term so in other words so when 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 we say are you creating their wealth we need to have a long-term measure for wealth creation, not a short-term measure for wealth creation. You get it? So, if we make you a finance manager, your job is to maximize shareholder wealth, but how do you discharge? Or in what environment do you discharge this job? So let's say financial management environment. Financial management environment. So the, by this, we are saying this objective to maximize shareholder wealth is discharged in a principal agent 
relationship. So we are saying wealth maximization. Wealth maximization is discharged in an agency relationship. Agency relationship. Agency relationship. So you need to know uh, why do we say this is an agency relationship? Because we have a situation where directors of the company are agents. Directors, they are agents. Directors are agents and shareholders. Shareholders principal. Directors are the agents and shareholders are the principals. Okay, oh guys, sorry for that. Sorry for that. Uh, sorry for that. What what is it that I was saying? I was saying, you know, directors are the agents and shareholder is the principal. And normally, normally what happens is whenever there is an agency relationship, they they there is bound in most instances. To be to 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 be the to have the incidence of an agency problem. Have you, have you ever heard of an agency problem? Can you talk to me? What do you understand by agency problem? You can unmute and answer yourself. Too far because we are we are we are not yet ma much in the group. Yes, could. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I just want to try. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps you can think of what is called uh, conflict of interest. It's conflict of interest. Yeah, in in, in 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 a simple in a simple sense, that's what it is. Agency problem arises when directors are now pursuing their interest, which is at variance with what shareholders want, and they, they we call that agency problem. That's agency problem. So what then do you have to do? You have to minimize the agency problem to make sure that interests of shareholders are aligned with interests of share of directors, so that there is goal congruency. So how do you minimize agency problem? You incur what we call agency costs, meaning costs of ensuring that directors are executing their duties in line with what shareholders want. That is called agency costs. So. So here is how we go about it. So we say FM environment. So, so let's say there might be there might be an agency problem, agency problem, problem resulting in resulting in uh, lack of goal congruency. Resulting lack of goal congruency. problem is when there is lack of goal congruency. Congruency. I'm sure that the spelling should be congruency. Lack of goal congruency, something like this. Goal congruency is when shareholders, we, we say we don't have goal congruency when shareholders are pursuing their interest, directors are equally pursuing their interest, kind of, or shareholders, we have interests of shareholders, but for whatever reason, Directors are doing whatever they seem fit, which is it varies with what shareholders require. We say there's lack of goal congruence. So in mitigation, right, is to bring about in, in order to bring about goal congruency, in order to bring about goal congruency, goal congruency, comma. Shareholders need to incur agent costs. Shareholders need to incur agency costs. Shareholders need to incur agent costs. So that, that's an issue here. Shareholders need to incur agent costs for us to have goal congruency. And what are agent costs, if you may ask? Agent costs are costs of ensuring that the interest of directors are being met by what uh, the interest of shareholders are being met by what directors are doing. 
So there are costs of whipping directors into line. Can you, can you tell me what, as a shareholder, you can do to ensure that what directors are doing is in line with what you want? Can you type in the chat? Or you can raise your hand. What do you think as a shareholder you need to do to ensure that whatever directors are doing are, is in line with what you need to, what you what, what with your interests that you are set to achieve? Meaning prof, uh, shareholder wealth maximization. I'm seeing nobody's typing. <laughs> Okay, so I take the silence to say, say, it appears you are on, you are right on track, just finish what you're doing. <laughs> so, it is still fine, guys. Let me take you through what, uh, what, sh what shareholders can do to ensure that their interests are being met. So, these are like urgent costs, bringing about goal congruence. So, number one, intro. Performance based remuneration. Performance based remuneration. Performance based remuneration. So, what you may say, what is performance based remuneration? We are actually saying instead of, of paying directors fixed salaries, let us pay them salaries which are based on performance. If we do so, we compel them to think in the best interest of shareholders. Because if they don't perform, they don't get money. Get that? Another it's having a balanced board. Or, or, or let's say having a balanced board. What is a balanced board? It is a board, a board with both a board with both executive executive and non-executive directors executive and non-executive directors that's another way of bringing about go con congruency you know there are two types of directors there are basically two types of directors. There are directors who work for the company, like managing director, finance director, and stuff. We call those executive directors. But there are certain directors who don't work in the company, who come from outside. They just attend meetings and deliberate strategy and stuff. Those directors are called non-executive directors. So in a, in, you may ask, why are they needed if they don't work for the company? They are needed because they bring external perspective to what the company is doing. They bring wider awareness when we are discussing strategy for the company. Also, we need these external directors to question and or scrutinize the work or performance being done by executive directors. Because if we leave executive directors alone, imagine a situation where you leave the MD to determine his salary or his salary. The MD can end up taking the, all the money. So there is need for non-executive directors, those who don't work for the company, to come and determine what the executive director should earn. This is done to ensure that we protect the interest of shareholders. We, pro we avoid the situation where these guys are paying themselves more than what value they are creating to shareholders. In other words, we bridge the goal congruence. We bridge the we, we bring into we bring about goal congruence. So that's one way. Another way, number three, is in supervision of monitoring and supervision of work done by executive directors, of work done by executive directors, executive directors, e.g. setting performance targets, setting performance targets and periodically review them. Review 
use them. That's another way. Another, so we, we, we need to ensure that what directors are doing is in line with the targets that we have set so that they are in they, they are pursuing the direction that shareholders want the company to go. Another is hiring auditors, assurance engagements, hiring external auditors, external auditors for assurance engagements. You know, you you do have these types of engagements. The reason why we hire external auditors, if you may ask, why, 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 why really do we need to hire external auditors? We hire external auditors because there is a chance that they, what directors are doing might not be in the interest of the general users of financial statements, shareholders included. So directors are, I mean, auditors are then hired to express an opinion as to whether this financial statement or whatever information we are, we are getting from executive directors is feathering the interests of shareholders. You get that? So there you go. Another way is number five, it's having annual general meetings. Having annual general meetings. Annual general meetings to vote on resolutions, on resolutions being proposed, proposed by director. Uh, yeah, having annual general meetings for shareholders, let's say for shareholders to vote on resolutions being proposed by directors. That's another way. You have annual general meetings to ensure that, you know, the purpose, why, the reason why we have annual general meetings is to ensure that before directors carry on with what they want to do, shareholders must vote to support that. It's a way of bringing about goal congruence that way. Because if shareholders vote for something, when directors are now doing it, nobody will be complaining to say our interests are not being met. No. You get that? Another it's another another way of bringing about goal congruence, which is number six. It's uh, number six might be awarding share options, awarding share options to directors, awarding share options to directors. You know the reason why we give share options to directors is because they begin to act like shareholders so that so that they becoming shareholders they becoming shareholders shareholders may act in the interest may further the interest of shareholders the interest of shareholders Right. So, what are we saying with this? What we are saying with this is, what we are saying here is, if you give shareholders shares in a share option scheme, for example, uh, if you give directors shares in a share option scheme where you are now paying them with shares to say, look, if share price of a company gets to this, you 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 are entitled to twenty thousand shares, for example. What will happen? Once that happens, shareholders will be motivated to make sure that they are performing better to increase the share price. And they then become entitled to those shares for free. These are called share options. They may be given these shares for free by merely increasing a share price, by merely performing to ensure that the share price is at a certain level. Shareholders may say to directors, if you can only get share price of OK to eight dollars per share you being shareholders we will give you ten thousand shares so if you are a shareholder now you are now motivated because you will become a shareholder so you are now thinking in the interest of shareholders as simple as that you, there's no more go there's no more agency problem there's now goal congruence right 
then a uh, duties of finance manager duties of finance manager oh, sorry sorry duties of finance manager finance manager now if we make you the finance manager what is it really that we are looking for suppose you now say say if i see a vacancy which is saying finance manager what is it that i'm looking for you know basically basically the overall duties of finance manager are like this if 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 you don't mind let me take you through to something that you already know uh, does anyone know the parable of of talents do you know the parable of talents anyone guys you can unmute and talk to yourself or oh, concerning what you know about parable of talents which was spoken by Jesus in the Christian Bible. Do you know that? Anyone to try? Yes, 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 can go ahead. What what do you understand by that? Um, I, 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 my understanding of it is vague, but I remember that a master uh, gave a, an equal amount of, of talent to, I think, three of his servants. I'm not quite sure. And then yes. he, he, I think he went away for some time. Then one of the servants did not manage his uh, talents very well, something like that. And then the others managed them very well. All right. Let me spice it up. Thanks. You, you really know the parable. So that parable, you know, it was Jesus speaking. He said, the kingdom of God is like this, meaning today. If you want to know what, how, the, what, how the, what, what the kingdom of God looks like, he said is like this. It's around Luke 22 or something. Luke 19, Luke 20, between Luke 19 to 20. The kingdom of God is like this. So he said a master had three servants. So let us say servant one, servant two, and servant three. This is what, these were the servants for the master. And the master said, I want to go away for a long time. So you guys, occupy yourselves with this money or talent. And the Bible says to the first he gave five pounds. He actually, it, it actually said money. To the second he gave two pounds. And to the last he gave one. And then he said, occupy with this, or yourself with this money. This is my money till I come. And after a long time, meaning long term, not short term, after a long time, the masters came and said, can you guys present yourself before me? I want to see how much money you have earned from investing of the funds that I gave you. I want to see how much money you guys have earned from the investment of the funds that I gave you. So the first servant said, master, you gave me five, now I made five more. So I now have 10. I now have 10. That was the first seven. You gave me five, I made five more. So I now have 10. And the master said, well done, you faithful seven. From today, you are now in charge of 10 cities in heaven, which were prepared from the foundation of this world by your father. Can you imagine the reward of utilizing shareholders' wealth well? And then the second servant said, Master, you gave me two, I made two more. And the master said, likewise, well done. You are now in charge of four cities in heaven, prepared from the foundation of this world by your father. And then the last servant said, Master, no, the last servant started telling Master strange things. The last servant said, Master, the issue with you is you eat where you did not sow. You want to reap where you did not sow. Are you not seeing the last servant is introducing agency problem? He's saying, look, you want me to maximize your, way, your wealth. So the last servant is an agent who is not a finance manager, who is giving rise to agency problem. He's telling the master and saying, master, you have a problem of trying to reap where you did not sow. So 
The dollar you gave me, I still have it. I hid, I have hidden it somewhere. I still have the dollar you gave me. So I, I wrapped it in the napkin in the end is there. And you understand what the master said? The master said, you wicked and foolish servant. Wicked and foolish servant. How come you 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 could not put you could not invest my money and any profit? Now here's the punishment. Can you let let us take the dollar that the seven years and give it to one with ten? You know this is how financial management works. If you don't maximize shareholder wealth, the field that you have is taken from you and given to the one who is the highest. No wonder why the companies, the few companies which are wealthy, they continue to be wealthy. It is so, and it, uh, Jesus actually said it. Now, at, at personal level, if you don't utilize the resources entrusted to you, if you don't utilize them well at personal level, as you can see, you lose salvation. Failure to utilize the resources well at personal level, you end up losing salvation. Like this person is, he was cast into the lake of fire for not utilizing your, your talents well. And failure to utilize your talents well, according to Jesus, is a definition of wickedness. You know, this, this servant did not commit murder or adultery. This servant, what the servant only did was failure to multiply the resources entrusted to his disposal. And Jesus said, that's wickedness. Now, can you imagine now, on a contextual basis, if you have a company whose finance director is servant number three, if we have a company whose finance director is servant number three, suddenly you just hear that uh, the business is closed. And you wonder, why is it business, this business is closed, yet all other businesses are flourishing? Don't blame COVID. Don't begin to blame circumstances. Don't begin to... You need to consider the makeup of directors. Uh, the quality and characteristics of directors in this particular company aren't they of category number three. Because if they are, if they are of category number three, we, we run the risk of the company failing suddenly and you wonder. Okay, guys, if you have any background noises, please mute. Any background noises, please mute, guys. All right, so here's the deal. From this, you can now tell the, what are the duties of a finance manager. The duties of a finance manager is what these two first two servants, servants did, which this one did not do, constitute the duties of a finance manager. So the duties of financial manager are actually classified into four main categories. The first one is investment decisions. Investment, investment decisions. As a finance manager, you are in charge of scanning the environment to timelessly exploit profitable projects. In other words, you are a finance manager when you make sure that shareholders' funds are not idle. Funds of the company are not idle. Rather, the funds of the company must be invested. And when you are investing funds of the company, we say you are making investment decisions. That's one of your role as a finance manager, to make investment decisions. Another duty of a finance manager is or it's financing decisions. Financing decisions. What do we mean by financing decisions? We are saying, if we make you a finance manager, you must know that you, you need to have knowledge on the sources of finance in order to meet your investment decisions. In other words, for, for a company to invest, it needs money. So as a finance manager, you need to know the sources of those finance. And it's one thing to know the source of finance. You also need to know the cost of that money because there is no money that you get for free. 
every money that you get in a company has a cost to it. So as a finance manager, you must ensure that the company has access at all times to low-cost finance in order to meet its investment and operational decisions. Are you getting it? Let me repeat. For a company to meet its investment and day-to-day -day operation, it needs money. As a finance manager, you need to know where do we get that money, that sources of finance. And you also need to acknowledge that we don't get money for free. There is a cost to the money that we get. We call that cost of capital. So the finance manager then, you must ensure that at all times, the firm has access to low cost finance in order to meet its investment and financing decision. So there you go. Another duty of finance manager, which is duty number three, is about dividend decision. Dividend decisions. You know that as a company, when shareholders invest money in a company, they expect to make money. Listen, when shareholders invest money in a company, they expect to make money. We don't just invest money for the sake of investment. We invest money expecting to make money. So you as a finance manager, you need to ensure that if a company has now made a profit, how much can we set aside as dividends? to pay to shareholders. When you, are, when you are making such decisions, we say you, you, are, you are discharging your role as a finance manager in terms of dividend decisions. You get it? You know, there are risks if you don't pay dividends to shareholders. Suppose a company is making profit and they have you as a, share, as a finance manager and you are not declaring dividends you are not declaring dividends to shareholders. You know the risk? The risk is shareholders may actually remove their investment in your company and invest elsewhere. Shareholders may sell their shares in your company and take the money to invest in other companies. So in other words, they might be bad blood. There might be bad relationships between you and shareholders if you don't pay them dividends when the company makes profit. So you need to ensure that as a finance manager, you do have a dividend policy which is able to attract, which ensures that the firm is able to attract and retain investors of good caliber. That's your dividend decisions. And then number four, risk management. management. So another, that's another role. You know, risk management acknowledges the fact that as managers, when we are making decisions, we don't have perfect information. We make decisions under imperfect information. So because decisions are made under imperfect information, these the decisions we make are, accept, are susceptible to risk. So finance manager, then you must come up with a risk management strategies, which keeps financial risks that the company is, is facing to the minimum. Like nowadays, you may sell to a company in South Africa, you receive your, your money in runs, you then have to convert it to dollars. There is a risk that exchange rate between now and the time you receive the money, the exchange rate may move it in your disadvantage, so that you, the rand may gain value or may lose value. So if the, if the rand lose value and you're expecting to and you're expecting to, 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 to receive runs, it means you are now getting less dollars. If the rand loses value and you're expecting to receive runs, it means if you convert the runs to dollars, you now get fewer dollars. This is a risk that you as a finance manager, you must ensure that the company is not exposed to all these risks. You get it. So this is actually the overview of financial management. What I have just said now is the syllabus of financial management. It is the sum total of everything that we are going to discuss concerning financial management. I'm sure you, 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 are, you, are, you are getting that. It's, it's basically everything that we are going to discuss on financial management. Now, let me now come to the first discussion item. You realize that the servant who did not invest the money was punished. And at personal level, 
a servant, a finance director who sits on shareholders' funds and just let the funds be idle, such a servant, at personal level, you lose his salvation. At company level, the company can fail to operate as a going concern. At company level, you can annoy shareholders and shareholders may fire you. You may as well result in shareholders divesting from you, meaning selling their shares and invest the money elsewhere because you are a servant who is not furthering the interest of shareholders. So let us discuss your duties one by one and this now forms the basis of our syllabus. So if you understood the introduction, the introductory part, yeah, you, do you now appreciate what financial management is about? You can type in the chat just to ensure that we are together. Can you type in the chat? Do you really appreciate now what financial management is about? All right, so perfect. At least I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting responses there. If you can, if you can now appreciate it, that's, that's, that's correct. We can now take it up and escalate it to the, to the, I, I can see someone is typing. Yes, oh, you guys are typing and appreciating what financial management is about. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. That's fine. You now already you now know what are you not seeing from what we have said that financial management is not about preparing financial statements. No. So don't say financial management complies with international accounting standards. No. Financial management doesn't have to do with preparation of financial statements and other. This is the rule of financial accounting or financial reporting. Financial management is a force under management accounting. How best to utilize these resources at our disposal? How best to get the money for our operational needs? How else can we get the money for our investment needs? That's what financial management is about. That's basically what financial management is about. You get it. So, continuing. Now let us have... Uh, let us have investment appraisal as a, as, a, as, a, as a topic. This is now our first topic, investment appraisal. You know, often in our interactions, we say, I want to invest, I want to invest, but we don't necessarily know what we are talking about. Some may say, suppose you have a boutique, I, I, bought, I bought goods, uh, 700 bales of clothes. To in my, for my boutique, I bought 20 bales of clothes for my boutique. That is normally, that is called working capital investment. But normally we say, I have invested, I know. It's called working capital investment. We shall discuss that when we are discussing working capital. The investment appraisal we are talking about here, these are major investments, which require huge initial cash flow now. It requires a huge outflow now with cash inflows materializing in future. Are you getting it? We are talking of investments which require a huge initial outflow now with cash inflows materializing later in, in future years. That is called a capital project. So we have a capital investment project, a capital investment project requires huge initial requires huge initial outlay now with cash with cash inflows materializing with cash inflows materializing in later years in future years future years that's the classic definition of a capital project. You require huge initial outlay now with cash inflows materializing in future years. So what are the examples of such examples of capital projects? 
examples of capital projects. Capital projects. So there are quite a lot of examples containing capital projects. There is what we refer to as there is what we refer to as expansion projects. Expansion expansion projects. No? You may ask and say, say, what are these? Expansion projects are basically projects which are meant to expand the scope of the firm's current operations. Suppose you want to expand your trucks, you are into outlet business and you think to buy a 10 additional trucks, that's an expansion project. You want to expand the scope and scale of your existing operations. Now, the, apart from expansion projects, there is replacement projects projects. What are these replacement projects? Replacement projects are projects which, you know, as the name suggests, they are projects which are meant to replace current or existing projects. That's replacement projects. Projects which we undertake to replace current or, or I mean current or old projects. You may ask and say, say, in what way is this a very good, a very involved decision? Sure. You know, often in our interactions, we say, ah, I'm sure this person should replace the truck. You know, you, you, you come across someone's bus or someone's haulage truck, or uh, we call it gonyet. You come across someone's haulage truck, you would say, mm, I'm sure it would be wise for this person to replace the truck. Why is it you are saying it like that? You are actually saying the decision to invest in the truck was a good one. But for it to last, you must know when to replace. You know, if you know how to invest, but you don't know when to replace, the wealth you created, you might actually erode that wealth if you don't know when to replace a, 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 a project. So you have to know that. And then there is mutually exclusive projects the exclusive projects mutually exclusive projects you know these cannot be undertaken together be undertaken undertaken together they are mutually exclusive so when we are saying mutually exclusive, it means if you accept one, it automatically excludes the other. So if the examiner tells you that project A and B are mutually exclusive, always know that if you accept one, you automatically exclude the other. Then another here is replace uh, independent projects. Independent projects. Now you may ask, what are independent projects? Independent projects, if, if, I am, if, if, if the project is independent of the other, it means they can be undertaken together. They can be undertaken together. That's independent projects, projects which you can undertake together. Together. That's independent project, projects which can be undertaken together. And then we do have, we do have divisible projects. Divisible, divisible projects. And this, these are just term, terminology. A divisible project is a project which can be partly implemented. So this one can can be partly implemented implemented thereby enabling the firm enabling the firm to realize part of the expected benefits to realize part of the expected part of the expected benefits 
that's divisible project project which you can implement in part and by doing so you 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 you, you, you don't you don't realize the full benefit you actually realize also part of the expected benefit suppose you want to buy a bus and the bus is costing 250000 if you have got just say 80000 and the bus is costing 250000 you can't buy a fraction of a bus you, you get that? You can't really buy a fraction of a bus. A bus is costing 250,000 and you have 80,000. You, you, you can't say, I, let me buy a fraction of it. That is called an indivisible project because the amount you have is not sufficient for the bus. But if you want to start a taxi business, meaning this business of taxis, and you the business requires, you want to buy 20, Cabs totaling to 250,000, but for now you only have 100,000. You can buy you can buy cabs which are enough for 100,000 because clearly it's divisible. You can do it in parts if you don't have enough money. It's so important. An indivisible project cannot be undertaken if you don't have enough money. A divisible project can be undertaken even if your, the money you have is insufficient to the tune of the overall amount that you needed. You get that? So continuing. Continuing. So there are quite a lot of things that we, we may discuss concerning investment appraisal, but let me take you through these step by step. So the other discussion item here is determination of project cash flows. Determination of project cash flows. Determination of project cash flows. Meaning, when you are when you want to come across to 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 calculate NPV or stuff for the project, how really do you determine the project cash flows? This is the most important discussion item. Let's say your project is is just two years. To so say year, year year zero. We have year one, we have year two. Remember, year zero means now. Year zero means today. So if you want to determine cash flows for the project, you do you prepare a cash flow template like this. So you, you observe the monetary notation notation that your figures are in dollars. You know there's an element of you being neat. Your figures are in dollars. So here is how you come up with project cash flows. Here is how you come up with project cash flows. So it will be like this. Um, let me let me. Okay, the, let me put the figures in the middle. Let me put the figures in the middle, and this one. Let me leave it like. This. So you say incremental sales, incremental sales. So what are your incremental sales? Your incremental sales, you say X, X. Notice in year zero, I don't put anything because year zero just means now. So incremental sales, I start in year one going forward. Then less incremental costs, less. costs so incremental costs are costs so i put them is negative that's incremental costs and then what do i do next i find what i call pre-tax cash flows i find what i call pre-tax cash flows pre-tax cash flows Right, so here, here, here you go, pre-tax cash flows. And then after getting pre-tax cash, cash flows, I say tax at, tax at, let's say Y percent, you'll be given the tax rates by the examiner. So I'm putting it as negative. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a tax, it's, it's a payment, so it's negative. So I, I get it like that. And then I say less, Oh, I say add tax benefit on capital allowances. 
tax benefit on capital allowances. Capital allowances. Now, the tax benefit on capital allowances, yes, how it is calculated. You just say capital allowances, capital allowances times tax rate. Capital allowances times tax rate. That's how we calculate tax benefit on capital allowances. As you can see, it's a benefit, so it's positive. It's a benefit, it's a benefit this one here. Then after calculating tax benefit on capital allowances, I then I then say less incremental working capital. Incremental working capital. Now, incremental working capital is merely the, you know, for a project to start, you need working capital. For you to begin to sell clothes, you need to order the clothes first. And the inventory of clothes you have, it's working capital. So working capital starts now. And in finance terminology, now means year zero. So that's working capital. It's year zero. So incremental working capital can either increase or decrease. It can be positive or negative. I shall show you shortly. But in the final year, it's usually positive. So there you go. And then we say initial outlay. Initial cost another term for it is initial outlay initial outlay it's, it's, it's initial so you put it in here there and then if the project has a residual value meaning can be sold at the end you come up with the residual value and you put it at the end like this residual value and then after doing this you get what is called net cash flow for the project. So what you get here is called net net cash flow, net cash flow for the project, for the project. And then what do you do after getting net cash flow for the project? Uh, so this is this is negative. In year zero, it's negative. This might positive, positive. Then what you do is you then have to put discounting factor. It is called present value interest factor at X percent. This is better known as discounting factor. Discounting factor. So once you put your discounting factor, it will be at X percent. You, 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 you get discounting values from tables. We, we give you the tables. But the discounting factor for year zero is usually one. And for these ones, you can get them from tables. You, you get these from tables. And what, once you get that, you multiply the net cash flows by the discounting factor. What you get is called present values. These are called present values of cash flows, present values of cash flows. So you now have present values. In year zero, it is still remain negative, but these ones will be positive, right? With present values of cash flows, if you add them together, you say net present value equals net present value, net present value equals you then say sum of PVs, sum of PVs. If you just add this line, sum of PVs, you then get net present value. Simple as that. So that's how you determine cash flows. You use information given to come up with cash flows like this up to this level, and then you can calculate your net present value. Now let this let us now have points to note. Points to note. These are the main points to note. Let, uh, make sure you, 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 you commit these to memory. It's like NB. NB number one. Sunk costs. Sunk costs. Sunk costs such as research costs, such as research costs. 
not in, are not are not included are not included is they are irrelevant relevant to the decision decision you get it you may be told by the examiner that the company is already incurred market research costs of 200,000. When you, when they, you don't put them here because they are already sunk costs. The cash flows you include here are relevant cash flows, meaning those costs we are going to incur, not what we have already incurred. Costs that we are going to incur is what we include. Point number two. Point number two is, if tax is paid one year in areas, if tax is paid one year in areas, in areas, comma, then the project is cash flow, the project is cash flow, the project is cash flow, extended by a year is extended by a year. What do we mean by that? When we say tax is paid one year in arrears, what's your understanding of that, uh, Tendai? When they say tax is paid one year in arrears, what's your understanding of that? You can unmute and talk to yourself. Yes, Tendai, are you hearing your say? When we say tax is paid one year in areas, in your opinion, what does that mean? Okay, I can help you decipher. Ah, anyone to try Tafar? Oh, Tafsich, what do you understand when you say tax is paid one year in areas? I, I just said it's not so bad that after a year. Yes. It means it means tax is not paid in the year of accrual, but a year after. So if that is the case, you are paying tax one year in areas and you have and you have a project of two years, it would mean tax for year one is paid in year two. Tax for year two is paid in year three. So you would add another year there for tax. So the same would apply to capital allowances to take benefit on capital allowances. So going by this, it, it so you say tax benefit, tax benefit on uh, tax benefit on capital allowances or allowances would, would follow the same timing, this uh, follow the same timing, timing as tax. So what, what we are saying is, if we are paying tax one year in arrears, and we are saying tax for year one goes to year two, it means cap tax benefit on capital allowances would also follow the same thing. The benefit for year one will go for year two. Simple as that. And B, number three, interest payments. Interest payments are excluded from annual cash flows are excluded from annual costs costs annual sorry, annual costs because they are irrelevant to the decision they are irrelevant irrelevant uh, relevant to the decision if you are told that the project is being financed by a loan, it means interest payments, you don't include them from incremental costs because they are irrelevant to the decision. What we mean actually is interest cost is implied in the company's cost of capital. Interest cost slash implied in the company's cost of capital in the company's in the company's cost of capital. So interest payment is implied in the company's cost of capital. You have to know that part. 
you may say, say, can you explain this part further? It's like this. You know, the part goes like this. If we are saying this is a future cash flow, let's say the future cash flow was six hundred to eight hundred dollars, and we discount with ten percent, like the discount factor is zero comma six zero six. Let's say this is ten percent. You know what does ten comma this mean? Are you not seeing the discount factor is an interest rate? interest rate. So if you multiply this 800 multiplied by the discount rate, you get present value. This becomes PV. Now, the question then is, are you not seeing that getting a PV employee implies deducting interest? That's what we have actually done. If you multiply by the discounting factor, the discounting factor is an interest rate. So if you get PV, you have actually deducted the interest. So what, 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 then, what then happens is, suppose you had included interest under cost and then proceed to discount. What it means is you have deducted interest twice. So no wonder why we say interest, pay, interest should not be included in payments. Otherwise, you will deduct it twice. That's point number three. Point number four, Point number four is, you know, point number four is simple. It simply says non-cash items are excluded when determining cash flows. Non-cash items are excluded because we are, we, we are including, we are calculating cash flows here. So we exclude non-cash items, e.g. depreciation, e.g. depreciation. It's a non-cash item. So when we say non-cash items are excluded, meaning we don't consider non-cash items. So what it means is, what it means is profit. If you are given profit, if you are given profit, then what you do is add back, add back depreciation to get cash flows. Add back depreciation to get cash flows you know we did we all did the statement of cash flows cash flow statements whether we did it at college or university or what the statement of cash flows taught us something it, it taught us that if you start with profit you add back non-cash items like depreciation profit on sale etc all these non-cash items are added back because we want to get cash flows. In other words, they were deducted. They were deducted, yet they were not cash flows. So we add them back to account for the fact that they were not cash flows. All right, number, not number five. Incremental sales may materialize as savings in costs, incremental revenue materialize as savings in costs as saving costs what do, what do, what do we mean by this don't always think that a project can produce something which can be sold there are certain projects which do not have sales they don't have sales but it, their income comes in the form of savings in costs can you imagine if you if you have a project like acquiring pastel accounting, so if you acquire pastel accounting, you save costs. So here, when where we say the incremental sales at the top here, you don't say incremental sales. You would say savings in costs. That becomes revenue from the project because if you are saving costs, that's how that's what the project is contributing to the firm. NB number six. NB number six is annual cash flows can be, you know, annual cash flows, or, or when let's say future cash flows, future cash flows need adjustment for risk and uncertainty. Need adjustment 
for uncertainty, risk and uncertainty. It will adjust for risk and uncertainty. So what do we mean by that? Because when you are planning for the future, you don't know what the future holds. So what do you do? Let's say A, risk. What do you understand by risk? You need to understand what does risk mean. Right. So risk in phase. Phase to variability of future cash flows from the expected. Variability of future cash flows. Cash flows from the expected. That's a risk. Risk means cash flows in future may materialize in a different fashion from what you expected. That's what we mean when we are talking of risk. In fact, that what the cash flows you are expecting in future may be different from what you are expecting. That's a risk. Then, risk can be measured, you know. Risk can be measured. Can be measured. Using standard deviation. Standard deviation. Using standard deviation or beta uh, or beta. Uh, let's say discussed later. Discussed later. So this we shall discuss the issue of beta and stuff. But allow me to say to say this. Often, if I ask you how, how much is the price of Packets and you don't know. You may say 50 cents a packet, and then you say plus or minus 30 cents. 50 cents a packet plus or minus 30 cents. This plus or minus 30 cents, you are saying you are not sure, but if you can budget 50 cents and plus or minus 30, meaning it can increase by 30, or it may be lower than 30, or anywhere in between. The plus or minus state is called the standard deviation. You are saying it's 50 cents plus, it may deviate from this. It's a, you are capturing risk with that. Another thing concerning risk is probabilities can be attached to risk. Probabilities, probabilities can be attached to risk. Probability be attached to risk but when it comes to uncertainty man let us now talk of uncertainty uh, uncertainty is now different uncertainty so we, what do we mean when you say probabilities can be attached to risk by by saying probabilities can be attached to risk we are saying you can say, what is the probability that I get a profit of 60 million if I invest in Asia? You can say 75%. The chance is 75%. When you are doing so, you are attaching probabilities to risk. So probabilities can be attached to risk. That much you know. And then what does it mean to say uncertainty? Uncertainty, if we define it, it simply means, this means absence of perfect information. This means absence, absence of perfect, absence of perfect information. That's uncertainty. Absence of perfect information. So it's an easy thing to, to remember that when we are saying uncertainty, we are simply saying information is not perfect. Information you have is not perfect. That means uncertainty. So. Uncertainty cannot be measured. Uncertainty cannot be measured. Cannot be measured. This you can't measure. Another, another, another distinction feature between the risk and uncertainty is that probabilities cannot be attached to uncertainties. Probabilities cannot be attached, cannot be attached to uncertainty. Probabilities cannot be attached to uncertainty. Okay, so 
we are saying because you are planning for the future, how then do you take into account risk and uncertainty? Because we say cash flows can be, future cash flows need to be adjusted for risk and uncertainty. So what, how do you go about it? We are still on NB number six. So we say techniques, techniques to incorporate, to incorporate, techniques to incorporate risk and uncertainty. And uncertainty. Uncertainty. How do you how do you go about it? I am numbering them now. Techniques to incorporate risk and dance. I'm sure you are also jotting down these points. It's it's so important. It's so important because you can as well have them on the go. The reason I'm typing this is because I want you also to benefit to de to develop a habit of typing. I don't want a situation where you get into the exam and say, ah, my speed say was very awful. If you see that in every lecture I am busy typing. It means I have taught myself to be speed. You have to do the same. What are the techniques to take into account, which you can use to take into account risk and uncertainty? You can use, you can, you can actually use what is called calculating, calculating discounted payback period. Calculating, calculating discounted payback period discounted uh, payback period. So what is what is a discounted payback period? It's basically, this is payback period which is computed based on discounted cash flows. So we are simply saying this is, this is payback period, payback period, which, which is computed which is computed using, using discounted cash flows. Because it takes into account the risk and uncertainty. I'm sure you, you, you have done F2. If you were exempted, all this issue of payback period and stuff, this is not an issue at FM level. It's an issue that we expect you to know from your knowledge brought forward. But if you had forgotten, let me give you an, an illustration of how payback period is calculated. So let's say you have a project here, like here. You have a project like here. Uh, let's say year zero. Year zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, and yes, the deal, you want to calculate discounted payback. When you want to calculate discounted payback, it's easy. Um, so you say, yeah, zero, one, two, three. Or you simply say, you, you, you first discount cash flows, meaning you get these present values here. When, when you have present values of cash flows, you, we say you have discounted cash flows because they are multiplied by a discount factor or present value interest factor. They are discounted. So if you, if you are discounting cash flows, you are taking into account the risk and uncertainty of those cash flows because you want to find their today's values. So, so when you say payback period, it is payback period which is discounted using, which is computed using discounted cash flows. In other words, present values of future cash flows, PVs, of future cash flows. You use PVs of future cash flows to calculate discounted payback. So you say, yeah, then here you say discounted cash flows. Discounted cash flows. Cash flows. And then in the third column, so let us have three columns. In the third columns, you put cumulative discounted cash flows. You put cumulative discounted cash flows. This is how you calculate 
this is how you calculate discounted payback period yeah discounted cash flows cumulative discounted cash flows let me re-emphasize that discounted cash flows are pvs meaning you must first compute present value to say you have a discounted cash flow you do everything we have done here up to the point of getting present value once you have present value you can now calculate discounted pay payback like this you then say say year zero to 1.9 let's say 3.9 remember year zero it's negative because that's where you spend 1.5 then uh, 1.2 1.5 1.6 uh, and 1580 these are these are your discounted cash flows i'm just giving dummy figures here i just want you to know how you calculate payback period i mean discounted payback period so you then say you remember payback period we are saying how long does it take to recover your investment how long does it take to recover your investment so in year one in year zero you in year zero the investment was 3.9 so as the cash flows as you are getting cash flows you are recovering them so by payback period you want to know how long does it take so we need cumulative total so cumulative we are simply saying this amount plus what you get in year one are now left with 2.7 and then you get another in, in year two we are now left with 1.2 you get another in year three you are now you now have positive positive 400 so so when you when when you get positive on cumulative total it means your investment was recovered because you were subtracting every cash flow every cash flow now it's now positive it means your 3.9 was back but you can't say you got your 3.9 in year three because year three ended when you had a positive 400. So when did you recover your full 3.9? You can't say in year two because by the end of year two, you still had a negative, meaning you were, you were yet to recover the, your initial outlay. So how then do you conclude it? You say my, pay, my payback period was two years plus some months in year three. So you then say discounted payback period equals, you come here and say discounted, discounted payback period, discounted payback period equals, notice what you do. You take the year in which you last had a negative cash flow. The year you last had a negative cash flow, which is two years, you say two years plus you then say your last negative cash flow which is you then say your last negative cash flow which was which is 1.2 over over the the cash flows you had in the year of actual payback which is uh 1.6 let me repeat the year in which you last had your negative cash flow is two years year two then you say plus we want to find the fraction in which that ne last negative cash flow was obtained you then say the last negative cash flow divided by the cash flow you received the last cumulative cash flow the last cumulative cash flow divided by the cash flow you received in the year of actual payback so you then say plus 1200 over 1600 like that so so you 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 then get this as two years as two 1.2 over 1.6 is 0 0.75 so it's 2 2.75 years you can put it this way or you can you can you can have it like you can have it like or two years you can say two years uh, put a semicolon and say 1000 open brackets and say 1200 over 1600 times 12 months to put these in months so you then say equals two years semicolon nine months 
two years, nine months. This is how you can calculate your payback, your discounted payback. It is simply called discounted because the cash flows are discounted. Then you say a project with a shorter payback thousand. Project with a shorter a project with a shorter payback period, a project with is prefer a project with a shorter payback period because it repays the investment earlier because it repays the investment earlier it repays the investment earlier you get that that's what that because payback means how long it takes to repay the initial outlay how long it takes to repay your investment now you may say say uh, you may say say what are, there is discounted payback and there is payback so suppose we were calculating payback period how are we going to calculate it so let me put it as nb Are asked if you are asked to calculate to calculate payback period payback period not uh, not discounted payback period if you are asked to calculate payback period not the discounted payback period what you do is you follow this follow the same steps steps above follow the same working above follow the same working above but 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 use net cash flows use net cash flows instead of discounted cash flows Net cash flows instead of discounted cash flows. Cash flows. Use net cash flows instead of discounted cash flows. Suppose you wait, suppose the examiner says calculate payback period. It's not saying calculate discounted payback period. It's just saying payback period. You you do the same. You 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 actually have you come up with this similar copy here. And paste. I mean, copy here and paste. Sorry, copy here. Same headings. Listen, guys. I copy here and paste it here. But instead of saying discounted cash flows, what I'm put here, I say net cash flows. Net cash flows. And here, instead of saying cumulative discounted cash flows, I just say cumulative net cash flows. Cumulative net cash flows. So if I'm getting my cash flows in the table, which line do I use? If I'm calculating payback period, I don't take present value. I take net cash flow. I just use net cash flows here, not discounted cash flows. Are you getting it? If I use discounted cash flows, I get discounted net. I, I get discounted payback. But if the question just says payback, it's not saying discounted payback. So if the question is saying payback, I do the same procedure and I get my net cash flows. And then I use my net cash flows in this same format. I then come to this and use my net cash flows here now to say year zero one two three. You're getting it. I I, I just follow the same steps year zero. Uh, oh, it's kept. I I just come here and follow the same steps year zero like this. Uh, year zero one two three. Up to four, but with the key thing here, where he what what I put here is, I put here cash flows instead of discounting cash flow cash flows cash flows i put here net cash flows net 
cash flows. That's simple. Make sure you just put here net cash flows, but not discounted cash flows. Simple as that. That's how you calculate pay big bill. Put net cash flows, not discounted cash flows. So this one is, is important. All right. So you follow the same processes above here. All right. So in what way then is discounted payback period preferable to payback period? You know, discounted payback period is preferable. Discounted payback period is preferable to payback period. Payback period. Because it takes into account, it takes, it takes into account, into account time value of money, time value of money. Account time value of money, number one. Another, another reason is both period, payback period, and discounted payback period, discounted payback period are advantageous, are advantageous, uh, are advantageous because they are easy to calculate, they are, they are easy to compute, they are easy to compute, comma, are based on cash flows, are based on cash flows, are based on cash flows, and can and cannot cannot be easily manipulated. Manipulated. Now notice, notice. If you are asked, what are the advantages of payback period, whether discounted or what? The issue here is these are based on cash flows. And you know, when something is based on cash flows and it does not take into account non-cash items, it's an advantage because cash flows can be proven. If you, if you promise me that year two, you will receive 1.5, you can't mislead me because I will check if you received 1.5 in year two. You can prove whether you have received it or not. But imagine if you said depreciation for year two will be 600. It's not possible to prove whether depreciation was 600 or not. So that's, that's, that's an issue. And the, so cash flow, anything which is based on cash flow, it's advantageous. But which, anything which takes into account non-cash items, it's disadvantageous. So we now have that. And then, um, but you may say, is, isn't it with disadvantages, the payback period? It's, it's also with disadvantages. What is the disadvantage of payback period, you may ask? The disadvantage is that it ignores overall profitability of the project. Notice, notice, payback period just, is, it, 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 it says a project which pays our initial investment earlier is ideal. If we now have a project which pays initial investment Later, it, it's ignored. Now, suppose it was like this here. Suppose it was like this. Let me copy. Uh, or, uh, actually, let me copy this part. Suppose we had another investment here. Let me paste it. Suppose we had another investment here. Let's say this investment had these cash flows. Its cash flows were like in year two, the cash flow was 800. In year three, the cash flow was 500. In year four, the cash flow was 28,000. Notice, when you are using payback period, clearly this project here, actually see you can actually see that it takes 
around so because these are the years it was years uh, 0 1 2 3 4 this this project here takes 3 years plus to repay the 3.9 it takes around 3 years 3 comma something years to repay the 3.9 so if we were using payback period for this project you do notice uh, to choose between the two you would choose this one which we started with because it is paying two years with some months but this one we because it is paying three years with some months this one would be ignored but can you consider what will happen in year four in year four this project is going to give us 26,600 but it is being ignored because it is a longer payback so the disadvantage of payback period is that whether the discounted payback period or the normal payback period, their main disadvantage is that they ignore overall profitability of the project. What do you mean say? I am saying they ignore cash flows which will happen after payback. They just say if a project is a shorter payback, it's fine. Whatever happens need not to be ignored, need not to be considered. Okay, so you have that. Now, continuing. So what was it that I was saying? I was saying future cash flows need to be adjusted for risk and uncertainty. One way of adjusting risk and uncertainty is calculating discounted payback period. Another way to adjust for risk and uncertainty is, is to use what is called, which is number B. B. Use, use risk adjusted cost of capital use risk adjusted risk adjusted cost of capital that's another way of incorporating risk and uncertainty you use risk adjusted cost of capital what does it mean meaning let me let me let some call it project specific cost of capital or project project specific cost of capital that's the risk adjusted cost of capital or project specific cost of capital what do we mean suppose you your business is a boutique and the the cost of capital or the return that you need for the money that you have invested in the boutique remember that's what we call cost of capital the return you need for the money you invested it's called the cost of the capital so if you have a boutique and the return that you need for that boutique is 12 percent it means 12 percent is capturing the risks associated with the boutique you say after i take all the risks associated with the boutique i expect to get a return of 10 percent but if you now want to venture into outlet business you want to go to transport delivery trucks and stuff you can't use cost of capital you can't say i expect a return of i expect a return of 10 percent also to the outlet business because these two businesses have got different risks so when you are evaluating cash flows for the outlet business you need to use cost of capital or the return which captures the unique risks of the outlet business and that is called risk adjusted cost of capital so it simply means this is Cost of capital, which captures, which captures the unique risks associated with the project, the unique business and financial risks, financial risks associated with project. And we call that the risk adjusted cost of capital risk adjusted cost of capital so there you go and then we go to the next another way of of incorporating risk and uncertainty oh okay actually let me show you something allow me to show you something no as you say if from time to time i show you questions it makes quite a lot of sense Allow me just to open these at random. 
but let me come to close to 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 other uh, okay oh sorry allow me to open uh, allow me to open a question question about three question papers so that I can I can show you with questions some of the stuff that I'm talking about. I can show you with questions. Um, uh, I'm still opening. I'm still opening. March June 2016. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, last one. Let me now open the last one. Um, let me now open the last one, the last one, the last one. All right. Okay. Let me see what I've opened here. So these are the questions that I've opened. Um, these are the questions. Okay. Uh, this one is. This one doesn't contain what I want. So let me close it. Let me open this one. Um, you know, you, you are given tables as well. Okay, this one we shall discuss. We shall discuss this part. Okay, you see in this question it says calculate discounted payback for the period, for the project. Calculate discounted payback. So you now know how to calculate discounted payback. So that one is done. You, you, you can't say, say, I still have problems with discounted payback. Okay. Let me continue opening other questions. There are other questions I equally want to open to show you. Okay. Let me try opening this and see what is there. Um, right. Notice this question here. It's 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 March June 2017. It's saying discuss the difference between risk and uncertainty in relation to investment appraisal. Three marks. It's a quick discuss the difference between risk and uncertainty when it comes to investment appraisal. Three marks. And then the other the other question says number C critically discuss how risk can be considered in investment appraisal process eight marks so as you can see this is your section C questions it was a twenty mark question so with what we are just discussing now with what we are discussing in this lecture alone you can actually get eleven marks out of this question. This tells you how this is important. So when I'm discussing and, and I'm showing you this, don't you have the impression that says giving us an introductory lecture, we shall start the real thing later. Give me say a minute, I'll be back.
right? I am back, guys. Okay, so let us proceed. Um, so I was saying, are you not seeing that with what we are discussing, you can actually score 11 marks in this paper? Because it's saying difference between the risk and uncertainty, we have explained it, we have given the difference, and then critically discuss how risk can be considered an investment appraisal. So we said risk means variability of actual cash flows from the expected, whereas uncertainty means absence of perfect information. We say the risk can be measured, but uncertainty can be cannot be measured. We also say the probabilities can be attached to risks, but cannot be attached to uncertainty. And now critically discuss how risk can be invest in incorporated in, in investment appraisal process. We said number one, by calculating discounted payback period. Why? Because discounted payback period takes into account the time value of money or risk unlike payback period, which does not discount cash flows. You get that? And then number two, we said, use project specific cost of capital or risk adjusted cost of capital. What, what is it? We said this is a cost of capital which captures all the unique risks associated with the project. And I gave you an example. I said, suppose you have a boutique and you require a return of 10%, that's cost of capital. And now you want to venture into our late business. And I said, surely you can't expect the return to be the same because these projects have different risks. So you do need a pro a, 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 a how late specific cost of capital. You get it. And then another, so we are, we are when we are, when I'm giving you the notes, I'm actually answering these questions back on the back of my mind. So make sure you are listening attentively to this. Another way of incorporating risk and uncertainty is, is that's number C, using expected value approach, using expected values, expected value approach. So what is expected value approach? So Expected value approach, you know what it, what it means? It uses, let me say, this approach uses, this approach uses probabilities, probabilities, probabilities to determine, to determine the expected payoffs Determine the expected cash flows. It uses probabilities to determine the expected cash flows. So how does it go about it? It's like expected cash flow equals expected cash flow cash flow equals you say sum of sum of probabilities proba sum of probability let me put it in brackets, sum of open bracket, sum of open bracket, probability times cash flow, probability times cash flow. If, 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 if that's how you use probabilities. So, so let's take, for example, ah, now I have question papers open, so I'm no longer going to, to use my, my examples. Now notice, can you can we read together where it's highlighted? Yeah. The highlighted uh, the what I have highlighted. It says variable cost per unit depends on whether dip, oh, if if I can if I can copy it. Let me copy it. Okay, uh, let me let me just have it there. It's saying Variable cost per unit depends on whether competition is, is maintained between suppliers of key components. The purchasing department has made the following forecasts. Competition can be strong, weak, moderate, or weak. Probability, 45%, 35%, and 20%. Variable cost, 10%, 12, I mean 10,8, $12, and $14. And now, Oh, sorry, can you guys mute? And now notice something. 
with that here. Now notice something. You, you want to know which variable go, cost to use. Like in this case, you have got three variable costs. So which one then do you have to use? Do you use $10.08? Can you use $12? Can you use $14.70? You don't know which variable cost to use. No wonder why we say you have got imperfect information. Cash flows, might, the variable cost might not materialize as you planned. So how then do you navigate this? If you want to evaluate this project, what then do you do? So as an illustration to this, we are saying, uh, as an illustration to, 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 to the expected value approach, you are saying here, variable cost depends on this. So if I copy this and I paste it like this, So, so, so I have copied and pasted. You know, you can you can equally do this. A variable cost. So it's saying variable cost depends on whether competition is maintained between key suppliers and the purchasing department has made the following forecasts. Now let me take the forecast here. I want to give the question of, of, of my own. So here are the are the forecasts. Copy. Um, let me paste them here. The purchasing department has made the following forecasts. So the following forecasts are like, okay, so there you go. Competition can be strong, moderate, and weak. And then here, a probability can be like this. So you copy, you, you, you actually put it nicely. This is the probability and the variable cost here. This is the variable cost. Cut here and paste it there. Okay, so it's ten dollars eight, ten comma eight, twelve comma zero zero, and fourteen comma seven, fourteen comma seven. So you have this. Now the required part might be the, you want to evaluate a project, but notice you don't know which variable cost to use. You can't be using all variable cost. No. So the required is calculate expected variable cost to be used in investment appraisal. Calculate cost to be used in investment appraisal. Investment appraisal. What is the expected variable cost to be used in, in investment appraisal. In this particular question, which variable cost do you think you are going to use? Now, as part of the solution, when because this is again risk, you don't know which one to use. And probabilities are attached to risk, as you can see. So you then use what is called expected variable cost equals. So solution, solution, you say, ex Oh, sorry. Solution. Solution. You say expected variable cost equals. Expected variable VC equals. Expected value from the formula there is simply sum of probability times cash flow. So expected variable cost equals. You just open the bracket here and say open bracket 45% times. Ten dollars eight plus thirty five percent times plus twenty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent times fourteen comma seven, which is a close bracket as good as it's as good as we are simply saying equals this times this plus this times this plus this times this and four dollars. So this is per unit. Per unit. So what it means is 
when you are now evaluating the project, when you are now evaluating the project, your variable cost that you are going to use, it's now $12. You are no longer going to use any other variable cost apart from $12. That's what you are now going to use in investment appraisal. So this is technique number three of taking into account the risk and uncertainty. And notice, I showed you a question which says, if, what, how risk can be in accommodated in investment appraisal? So I'm showing you here, but you may say, say, is the exam, was I supposed to give an example? No, you, you would simply say expected value approach. What, what, what is it that it does? Remember, there's eight marks, so it's, my, it's like just identify four and explain. Now, I am giving an example because I'm teaching the same approach, but I'm just showing you a question paper that it can be just asked with a theory without any calculation. Now, what are the limitations of this approach? The limitations of this approach is that uh, probabilities may, may not be reliable. You know, the probabilities may be just subjective or best guesses. Weakness of expected value approach, expected value approach is that it can be, it can be based on subjective probabilities, subjective, subjective probabilities, probabilities. What do we mean by subjective probabilities? We are saying best guesses. Best guesses. Best guess, which may not be reliable. Which may not be reliable. It may be based on subjective probabilities, which may not be reliable. That's an issue there. With, 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 with uh, expected value approach. Now, another way of incorporating risk and uncertainty is sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis, which is D. Sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis. <clears throat> what does sensitivity analysis do, if you may ask? What really do we mean by sensitivity analysis? You know, it's one thing to tell us as directors to say, let us invest in this project because NPV is positive. You know, the, the, you know, the assumption is that we are going to, to start a project today, but in practice, we don't start a project today. We may still need to buy the machinery. We may still need to construct warehouses, factories. We may still need to do quite a lot of things before we commence the project. So whilst we are doing all this, variable cost selling prices may change due to, say, competitors entering the market. Suppose we, you thought you would sell at $40. What will happen, in your opinion, if competitors enter the market? The selling price may decrease. What will happen if suppliers have problems? Variable costs may increase. What will happen if, 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 if there is lockdown? Initial outlay may increase. Suppose we thought we would buy in six months' time, but there's, there's COVID lockdowns. We are now buying in eight months' time. The initial cost may increase. So you need to, you then need to tell us as directors as to how sensitive is the project to these changes. In other words, the extent to which these changes can happen for our project to be unviable or to be, for, for us to say, oh, let us abandon the project. This is called sensitivity analysis. It's, a, it's an attempt to communicate better. So what you are saying is these measures, these measures, uh, the impact, the, these measures, uh, let's say these measures, the impact of a change in project variable the impact of a change in project variable project variable um, <clears throat> such as such as initial cost initial cost comma 
selling price selling price comma sales volume sales volume comma variable cost variable cost etc etc on the project is npv on the project is on the project is npv meaning how can this change for the project to be affected on the project is npv so 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 let us let us let me show you the sensitivities let's say let's say one in roman numerals Sen uh, sensitivity to sensitivity to let's say sensitivity to initial cost suppose the initial cost is to change how is the project going to be affected that's a risk element no wonder why we're taking risks and uncertainty you need you can't say initial cost is six million you have to ask yourself what if it increases above six million by how much should it increase for our npv to be zero you say sensitivity to initial cost equals npv over initial cost initial cost times 100 percent npv over initial cost times 100 percent let's say eg a percent equals 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 eg a, a percent and let's say eg seven percent what does that seven percent mean so meaning if you calculate sensitivity to initial cost and it comes out to be seven percent here is the meaning we are saying initial cost initial initial cost increase by seven percent for npv to be zero can increase by seven percent for npv to be zero that's what we are saying uh, for, uh, for for our project to to have zero value to the firm initial cost should increase by seven percent this is called sensitivity analysis you must do this at the beginning of the project to tell directors that should these things change this is by how much they should change before you abandon the project you get it then sensitivity to to sensitivity to variable cost sensitivity variable cost to variable costs you simply say npv that sensitivity of the project to variable cost npv over present value of variable cost meaning pv of variable of v of variable cost times 100 percent so you say eg x percent like suppose you get you calculate it and you get the answer is 10 percent what what is the meaning of this or comment of this figure you have to, to comment it to directors what what is the meaning of sensitivity to variable cost being 10 percent what you are saying here is you are saying variable cost can increase by so you are saying variable variable cost can increase by can increase by 10 percent for npv to be zero so that's what you are telling directors to say let us do the project but be in be be careful if variable costs increase by more than 10 percent you should abandon the project because npv your npv becomes zero and it, it runs the risk of being negative then another sensitivity to that's number three now sensitivity to sensitivity to sales to selling price selling price or sales volume selling price or sales volume what does that mean if you want to see sensitivity of selling price to sales volume you simply say equals how is your project going to be affected by selling price or sales volume you say 
NPV over present value. That's your PV, present value of contribution. Present value of contribution. NPV divided by present value of contribution times 100, oh, sorry, times 100% equals EG, equals EG, 5%. Let's say you get the answer is 5%. What is the meaning of this to you? Okay, so these are this, the formula for the sensitivities. Formula for the sensitivities. Commit this formula to memory. Commit this to memory because clearly the examiner will ask you all these, all these, and you need to comment, to calculate and to comment. So what is the meaning of this? If sensitivity to selling price comes out to be five percent, it means selling price. Selling price. Volume, sales volume can decrease, actually decrease, decrease by selling price or sales volume can decrease by, this time it's decrease, not increase, by 5% for MPV to be zero, to be zero. So that sensitivity analysis, it says before you take undertake a project, you need to understand variables which affect the project and see by how much those projects should, those variables should change for you to abandon the project. And if you do it like this, you are now informing directors better. But here are the weaknesses of sensitivity analysis. Weakness of sensitivity analysis. What are the weaknesses of sensitivity analysis? Don't just think it's, it's advantageous, though you are communicating things well to directors, but here are the weaknesses. Number one, the, the first weakness of sensitive, sensitivity analysis is that it assumes, it assumes that all variables can be identified, all. But all projects, all, all variables affecting the project can be identified. All variables affecting the project can be identified. Can be identified. Are you not seeing? We are saying project is sensitivity to variable cost, sales volume. It assumes that everything that affects the project, you can identify it and assess its impact. And assess its impact but you know it's not possible there are instances where you may not be in a position to come up with all variables that affect the project you might not be in such a position number two two is that it assumes that one variable changes when others are held constant it assumes that one variable changes, one variable changes whilst others are held constant, whilst others are held constant, whilst others are held constant. In other words, it ignores, ignores interdependence amongst variables. It ignores interdependence amongst project variables project variables, variables, you get that? It ignores interdependence amongst project variables. So, so this, these are the main weaknesses which are leveled against sensitivity analysis. They say if, if initial outlay is changing, it is only initial outlay which is changing. Other variables are not changing. If variable costs are changing, selling price and initial cost outlay do not change. So, but in practice, it doesn't work like that. If there is, if there is inflation, it would affect everything. So in this case, everything will be affected. 
But so the, it's not like they will depend on each other. Variable costs will affect the selling price you charge. You know that? If labor increases, it will affect the selling price you charge. So increase in labor, in increase, increase in variable costs will, will lead to increase in selling price. So under the circumstances, you want to do sensitivity analysis. Because it, affect, it, it assumes that one thing changes. It assumes, I wanted to say, it assumes, there's, there's missing word there, it assumes that one thing changes whilst the others are being held constant. But in practice, you know that if variable costs increase, selling price will increase. But sensitivity analysis says if variable, variable costs can change when selling price is, is, is constant. So that's a weakness there. So these are ways you can incorporate risk and uncertainty. So this one was sensitivity analysis. Then another is simulation, which is E. Simulation. So what does, what does simulation mean? Simulation simply means you are repeating or are carrying out random combinations <clears throat> of project cash flows, carrying out Carrying out a random combinations, random combinations of project cash flows, of project cash flows, in order, in order, in order to determine, to determine the probability distribution, probability distribution probability distribution of project is NPV, of project is NPV. And this, so the higher the probability, the higher, the higher the probability, probability, the more confident, the less, the less the risk, the project, the less the risk, the project yes. The project yes. The higher the the, 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 the the probability, the lower the risk, the project yes. This is called simulation. You know what? When you are simulating, you often of the I'm sure you, you at times come a, come across simulations. Let's say you, you are witnessing Olympics, you are having Olympics tournament. You do notice that. There might be a spot where someone can walk on a bar, on a bar, for example, like like on a, on a, on a log, on a, on a rope. A person can actually walk on a rope during Olympics. And you know what happens in, in those in those environments? The issue is the judges, they don't say just walk there once and everything is done. No. Judges will not will not say that. They don't say walk just walk on the rope once and they will give you an award no they may say why can't you repeat the procedure 10 times and if you repeat the procedure 10 times and you fall once after repeating it 10 times the judges are now they say they are now 90 percent sure that you can walk on the rope so by repeating the walking on the rope you are building confidence of the, of the judges in your ability to do that. So when they give you the prize, they, they no longer have the risk of giving it to the wrong person. So even with project cash flows, don't just have one uh, fixed cost, one variable cost, one selling price. No, you must have a range. You can actually say, you can actually say, let us, let's say VC range from 11 to 17. And let's selling price range from uh, 35 to 49. And then you can say simulate. You can simulate. So with this command alone, 
you can use a computer software. You know, simulation actually is done using a computer software. So with this command alone, it will calculate various NPVs at various combinations of cash flows within the range that you have commanded it to do. So with this command alone, you can get 1 billion NPVs in this range alone. Normally, you use the random digits. Microsoft Excel has got random digits. You can simulate using random digits. Another, another approach to simulation is called Monte Carlo simulation. It's, it's a software which is called Monte Carlo, which you can command on your computer, and it can simulate it for you. With this command alone, you can get 100 billion NPVs, or let's say you get 1 million NPVs. And after getting 1 million NPVs and 85, 850,000 of them are positive. So it would mean you are now 85% sure because 850,000 over 1 million is 85%. So you, now, you are now 85% sure that if you are to invest in this particular project, NPV will be positive. So simulation, as I have said, is done normally using a computer software. No wonder why we say random combinations. You can't do it manually. You can't simulate manually. Right? So we have discussed quite a lot of things. And now let us, let us look at these were NBs that we are actually, we were doing NBs. So the NB was actually number six, if you don't mind. It was future cash flows can be adjusted for risk and uncertainty. So that was the issue here. How do you adjust the risk and uncertainty for future cash flows? Now, continuing with this, let us now go to number seven, NB number seven. So all this was about NB number six. Let's now, let us now go to number seven. Let's say annual cash flows can be real or nominal. Annual cash flows annual cash flows can be real or nominal, you know? You can have real annual cash flows or you can have nominal annual cash flows. So you need to understand what are real annual cash flows and what are nominal annual cash flows. So let's start with the real, cash, real annual cash flows. Real cash flows. Cash flows which I can say RCF, real cash flows. So we said annual cash flows can be real or nominal. So what do we mean by real cash flows? What do we mean by nominal cash flows? So yes, the deal, real cash flows, these ones. Mm, first point, are not inflated, are not inflated. So in another way, real cash flows are current based on current prices. They are based on current prices. So real cash flows are based on current prices. You get that? And then because they are based on current prices, these cash flows are discounted. These cash flows are discounted using the real cost of capital. The, the real cost of capital. Cash flows are discounted using the real cost of capital. Because if we say real cash flows are not inflated, in other words, the discount rate used, it should be, it should also not include inflation, which is called the real discount rate. So it's called the real discount rate or, or the real cost of capital. And then let us have nominal, nominal cash flows. Nominal cash flows. Some call the money cash flows. Nominal cash flows or money cash flows. Now here are man, here is how you, you, you actually what we mean by money cash flows. Nominal cash flows or money cash flows. What are these? if you may ask. So money cash flows, these are inflated. They are inflated. Now, here is how you inflate a, ca a cash flow, if you, if you don't mind. 
you can say inflation adjusted cash flow equals inflation adjusted cash flow cash flow equals inflation adjusted cash flow equals when when you're calculating inflation adjusted cash flow you simply say a real cash flow rcf bracket one plus one plus say ir to the power n to the power when you want to put to the power on your on your laptop it's shift six to the power n power you get it by saying shift six where where rcf rcf is the real cash flow real cash flow and ir is the inflation rate ir equals inflation rate inflation rate and n is the year in which the cash flow occurs the year in which cash flow occurs So that's how you inflate a cash flow. Suppose you are told that there is a case, there is a real cash flow of 600 of 600 year 4 600 year 4 inflation inflation equals 7%. So if you want to inflate this cash flow you you then say nominal cash flow nominal cash flow which is inflated cash flow equals you say 600 times you know open bracket we say 1 plus ir so it will be 1 plus 0, 0,07 your inflation rate is put as a decimal close bracket to the power that shift 4 to the power 4 it's shift six if you want to put it to the power. So you then you then have it like equals six hundred times one comma zero seven to the power four. So your nominal cash flow will be seven eight six. Your real cash flow is six hundred and your nominal cash flow will be seven eight six. So that's how you inflate the cash flows. You get that? Once you inflate the cash flows, you then say the uh, uh, another point is are uh, discounted the inflated cash flow the inflated cash flows are discounted using they are discounted using nominal cost of capital nominal or money it means the same thing nominal or money discount rates discount rate it can be put as nominal cost of capital nominal cost of capital that's how we can call it money cost of capital or we can put it as nominal cost of capital you get that so if if you if you have a question like this one notice if you have a question like this one allow me to switch on the lights Okay, so if you have if you had a question like this one, which is saying, which is saying, uh, nominal cost of capital is ten percent, the real cost of capital is seven percent, and cost of equity is eleven percent. Now, if you have it, if you have it uh, like this, what it means there is. If you have inflated the cash flows, you use nominal cost of capital. Because cash flows are inflated. If you are given inflation rates here, like the variable cost is before taking into account inflation of 
Uh, there's selling price inflation. They, they are saying selling price inflation is expected to be 3.5%. So you need to inflate the cash flows. Once you inflate the cash flows, the discount rate that you use is the nominal cost of capital. You don't use the real cost of capital, but the examiner will give you both for you to choose. You get that? I want to get to, 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 to have an example shortly on that one. Now, oh, okay, sorry, I was, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be, to be on this particular thing here. So, write, uh, <clears throat> write this, if, if either real or nominal cost of capital is not given, if either real or nominal cost of capital, either real or nominal cost of capital is not given, comma, it can be calculated. It can be calculated, calculated using the equation using the Fisher equation, equation, using the Fisher, actually I wanted to say Fisher equation, Fisher equation given below. Suppose, suppose you have inflated the cash flows and you don't have the real, uh, the, the nominal inflation rate and you have inflated them. You then have to calculate the nominal if, if cash flows are inflated you, and you are given a real discount rate, you don't discount inflated cash flows with a real discount rate. No. And on, the, on, on, on another hand, if cash flows are not inflated and you are given nominal discount rate, you don't use nominal discount rate to discount real cash flows. No. You have to find it. And what, what the equation that you use is called the Fisher equation. And the Fisher equation is like this. We give it to you in the formula booklet. The Fisher equation will be like this. Here you are. This is the Fisher formula. The Fisher formula. So let me let me highlight it. This is the Fisher. No, how we how up here. Okay, so you see the Fisher formula. Let me just copy it. The highlighting is taking me. It's just one plus i equals one plus r bracket one plus h. So this is the Fisher formula. It's open bracket. One plus i, one plus i equals open bracket, one plus r close bracket, open bracket, one plus h. This is the Fisher formula. 1 plus h. And in this formula, i is the nominal rate where, where i equals nominal rate. So i is the nominal rate. And then r is the real rate. r equals the real rate. And then h equals inflation rate. H equals the general rate of inflation. General rate of inflation. So H is the general rate of inflation. So suppose I want to calculate nominal. I just put R and H and solve the equation. I get nominal. If I want to calculate a real, I, I put I and H and solve the equation and get the real rate. So the examiner will give it them to you in such a manner that you don't struggle to, to, to just key in and substitute. It will be easy. It will be easy. So this is guideline number seven, which is saying nominal cash flows can be real or nominal. I mean, annual cash flows can be real or nominal. So you now understand what we mean by that. And then the last guideline, the last NB, which is number eight, it's on incremental working capital. Incremental working capital. Incremental working capital. What do you 
What do you mean by incremental working capital? Now pay attention. You know, let's say the investment in working capital, the investment, the investment in working capital, investment in working capital is maintained. It is maintained at different levels is maintained at different levels during the project is life. Different levels during life. Project is life. Full stop. And the relevant cash flow, the relevant relevant cash flow is the amount is the amount required to increase or decrease amount required to increase or decrease the working capital left the working capital to a desired level right normally normally Comma. The investment in working capital, the investment in working capital, in working capital at the final, at the end of final year, final year is recovered, is recovered slash released when the project is disposed when the project is disposed. Now, let me bring this into perspective. Remember, we all did the statements of cash flows. When we were doing statements of cash flows, you were told that if receivables increase from 70 to 90, uh, the cash flow was not, they used to say if receivables increase from 70 to 90, the cash flow was not Nine, it was 20. Increase in receivables would say 20 outflow because the receivables increased by 20. If, if, if inventory decreased from 100 to 150, we would say cash inflow 50. We would take the decrease as cash inflow. So, in a project, when we are saying working capital, we are actually saying inventory, receivables, payables taken together. That's what working capital we are talking about. So if these are increasing or decreasing, the incremental is the cash flow. Now, if, if we take it like this and say, if we take it like this, yeah, let's say you've got yeah. Okay, let me narrow my columns because they're quite huge. Let me narrow them here to desired level again. <laughs> If, if if let's say let's say you have this and you say yeah this is this is working capital now you start with year zero zero one two three four let's say you've got four year project and yes the deal in this particular four year project you have working capital level working capital level you'll be told how to come up with working capital level. They may give to you as a percentage of sales, okay, or they can give it to you as figures. So if they say working capital is a percentage of sales, you'll be multiplying with the sales level, that percentage multiplied by the sales level. So in this case, let's say first year you need 500, second year you need 580, third year you need 440, and then here you need you need uh, 550. Notice, in the final year, please note this point here which I have written and which said, uh, this one, let me put it in, in red and in yellow as well because it's so important. I said normally the investment in working capital at the end of final year is released or recovered when the project is disposed. In other words, your working capital level at the end of final year must be zero. Meaning, 
if you are done with your boutique business, you don't leave it closed in the shop. You can't have a boutique and you are done at the end of year four and you still have clothes in the, in the shop. You need to sell all the clothes even at giveaway prices. We call that to recover your working capital, to bring your working capital level to zero. So if this is your working capital, it does not mean this is your cash flow. No. Your cash flow is the incremental cash flow. Incremental cash flow. That's how you put it. Incremental cash flow. So what are your incremental cash flows now? You then say in year zero, you invested 500. Notice. In year zero, you invested 500 because you had nothing. So incremental is minus 500. But in year one, it increased from 500 to 580. So incremental is 500 that you had in year zero minus 580. So it's a cash outflow. So it's actually 500 here minus 580. So it's a cash outflow of 80. 80 is the only cash flow, not the 580. In year two, it decreased from 580 to 440. So the cash flow is 140. It's positive because it's, it's a decrease. If you drag like this, you do notice in year three, it increased from 440 to 550. So the cash flow is minus 110. And in the final year, it decreased from 550 to zero. So you recovered your 550. So if you add this line, which is written incremental cash flow, it should give you zero. Notice the sum here, it's zero because you have recovered everything. So it is this incremental cash flow which you then put here as a cash flow on your project cash flow determination. When we say the incremental cash flow, when we say incremental working capital, we, 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 we are, you need to do this as a working. To say working capital level, you examine, I will show you how this level is calculated. Make sure you start in year zero and in the final year put zero because normally working capital is recovered in the final year. So you put zero. In other words, end of final year, it should be zero, so to speak. So you do it like this. And, and, and these are incremental cash flows that you then give to in the in the project, in, in your investment appraisal cash flows. Now, let us just do a simple, a simple question to inflate cash flows, and then we are done for today. Let us just do that and we'll be done for today. Let us do March, June 2019 question paper. March, June 2019 question paper. I just want I just want to show you how we inflate the cash flows and stuff. March, June 2019 question paper. So this one is I'm, I'm removing this. Yes, I want us to do this one. So this question, this question is saying, let me read it. It's Pink's company, March, June 2019 question paper. Allow me, allow me to send to you the question paper. So please be prepared in our today's lecture at least to dismiss around quarter past six. Let us just do this to finish this particular, to finish this particular paper so that we, we will be complete with our today's discussion. We can't, we can't just do it anyhow. March, June, 2019. So there you go. I've sent the question. Now, let me proceed. Kuzi, are you still there? Could you talk to you? Talk yes. to yourself? Yes, yes, I'm yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Allow us, because this time now I want you to, to, to participate. I want you guys to participate. So I'm reading the question. Pink's group. Notice it's March, June 2019 question paper, meaning your colleagues wrote this. Your colleagues wrote this. So let, let, let me read. Pink's is a large listed company on a major stock exchange. 
In recent years, the board of PINCS has been criticized for weak corporate governance, and two of the non-executive directors have recently resigned. You now understand what non-executive directors are. I told you at the inception of the lecture, I said, these are directors who don't work for the company. They are directors in a company, but they, they just come for their directorship duties, not to perform day-to-day -day activities of the company, like what finance directors do, like what MD does. A recent story in the financial media has criticized the performance of Pink's company and claims that the company is failing to satisfy objectives of its stakeholders. Pink's company is appraising an investment project which it hopes will boost its performance. The project will cost 20 million, payable in full at the start of the first year of operation. Uh, uh, the project's life is expected to be four years. The project is life is expected to be four years. Forecast selling price, sales volume, selling price and variable costs and fixed costs are like this. So you have got selling price, sales in units per year, selling price, variable cost per unit, fixed cost, you all have this. And now the selling price and cost information are in current price terms and before applying selling price inflation of 5% per year and variable cost inflation of 3,5% per year and fixed cost inflation. So what you are being told here is you must inflate these cash flows. And once you inflate these cash flows, what you get becomes nominal cash flows. Now, Pink's company pays corporate tax Pink's company pays corporation tax of 26%, with the tax liability being settled in the year in which the tax arises. The company can claim tax allowable depreciation on, on the full initial investment of 20 million on 25% reducing balance basis. So tax allowable depreciation, that's what we mean capital allowances. These are capital allowances, and they are being claimed on reducing balance basis. Then, the investment project is expected to have zero residual value. In other words, at the end of four years, the residual value is zero. PIX is a nominal after-tax cost of capital of 12% and a real after-tax cost of capital of 8%. So there is nominal and a real. The general rate of inflation is 3,7% in the foreseeable future. Now notice, required, calculate the nominal net present value for the project, 8 marks. Calculate the real net present value for the project, 4 marks. Comment on your findings. B, discuss four ways in which directors can be encouraged to achieve stakeholder objectives. You know, this, this, this is what we, we discussed at the beginning when we said ways to reduce the urgency problem. Notice, how do you reduce urgency problem? The examiner just needed four, but here we listed six. Number one, we said introducing performance-based remuneration. Number two, we said having a balanced board, meaning a board with both executives and non-executive directors. In this company, we are told that non-executive directors have resigned, so we need to hire another non-executive directors. Another point we said, monitoring and supervision of work done by executive directors, e.g. setting performance targets and regularly reviewing them. Hiring external auditors for assurance engagement. We said having annual general meetings for shareholders to vote on the resolutions being proposed by directors. Another, we said, awarding share option schemes to directors so that they, becoming shareholders, may further the interest of shareholders. So that, was, that is where your eight marks here are. This is your eight marks. So you need to play the video from the beginning to understand the explanation I was giving then. But what we want here, the reason why we have opened this question is we want the first 12 marks, this first 12 marks. So here is the first 12 months. It's saying calculate nominal net present value of Pink's company. 
So what you simply do is, our Kanban is Pink's company. Notice what I have typed. In a course of three hours, in a course of three hours, just notice, it's like the entire exam. So the Kanban is Pink's company. Pink's company. So, A1 is saying nominal NPV. That's A1. Question A1. Nominal NPV for Pink's company. Nominal NPV. When they say nominal, they mean inflate first. So, here is how you, you go about it. The way I'm doing it here is the way you do it. The way I'm doing it here is the way you do, you do it. Now, your exam is computer-based exam. Uh, <clears throat> apart from Tendai. Tendai, are you still in, in, the, in the group? Oh, well, Tendai is left, so she will play the recording. So, nominal NPV. So, here is how you go about it. You say, yeah. Yeah. You say, zero. One, two, three, four. Because we are told that the project is four years, and if we are told that tax, <clears throat> tax is twenty percent, <clears throat> and it is paid in the year the liability arises. In other words, there's no need to increase the project is life by a year because tax is not paid in arrears. Rather, it is paid in the same year it arises. If they say the tax is paid in arrears, we would increase by another year because tax for year one will be recorded in year two. Tax for year two will be recorded in year three. So you multiply tax rate with year one profit, but you record it under year two and so forth. So <clears throat> here is how you go about it. So you say here, uh, units. Units, let us put them in thousands. In thousands. Oh, sorry. Let us put them in thousands like this. Make sure in year zero you don't write units because units are not in year zero. <clears throat> they are in year. <clears throat> sorry for that. They are in years one to four. So it's 314, 525, 220. Units are 300,000, 410. 525 and 220. I have removed the three, the three zeros because they are now in thousands. And then I come here and say, oh, you know, so these units are control figures. I can even analyze the units acknowledging that these are control totals. So what I then have to do is to say, because I am inflating, I then say sales. Sales. Notice how you calculate sales. So remember, my units, let me put them as Q. These are Q in thousands. So if I'm calculating sales, I simply say, I simply say uh, Q quantity times selling price. These are the selling prices. 125, 138 ETC. So quantity times selling price. Then I say times one plus inflation rate. So it's one plus, because I, I, I am inflating. Remember, you say one plus. What is the inflation on sales? Inflation on sales is 5% year. So I say one plus 0, 0,05, 0, 0,05, close bracket, to the power shift 6 n to the power n. So what is my n? My n here is the year. So year is the n. So here, here I'm done. So I now have to know that my selling prices are changing. The first one is 125. So notice, I say in year one equals quantity. Mod, oh, oh, sorry. Before I say quantity times, let me insert Allow me to insert a column to put monetary notations. Let me say thousands. 
thousands. Mandatory notations are important in the interest of neatness. Copy here, copy here, and then paste. So these are my monetary notations. So I said quantity times selling price times inflation. Why am I saying to the power N? Because I have just written here, when you, we are when you are dealing with nominal cash flows, to inflate a nominal cash flow, you simply say real cash flow, meaning the one without inflation, and then say one plus IR to the power N here. So it is exactly what I'm doing here. Be, the cash flow without inflation is quantity times selling price, and then I'm out, I inflate it. So in year one, I'm saying times, notice my keys, quantity times selling price is 125. Then I say times, I open the bracket and say 1 plus 0 0.05. Inflation on sales is 5%. I say to the power shift 6 and for N, I just multiply the year like this. Press enter and I drag it to year 4. And then I put it to two decimal places. Now, my selling price is changing. It was 120, 130, 140, 120. So I then have to come to the figures here and change. Here it was 130 for year two. 130 for year two. 130. And then for year, selling price for year three was 140. Now I just changed the selling price here in my formula. For year four, the selling price was 120. So I just change it like this. You get that? And then I come here and say, which, is, which one is another cost? Variable cost. Variable cost is 71 per unit, but it's before inflation of 3.5%. So what do I do? I then say variable cost, VC, open my bracket. I say quantity, because that one is per unit. And then I say times 71 times open bracket, 1 plus R inflation, which is 0, 0.035, that's 3.5 percent, close bracket, to the power N, N is the year. So because it's a cost, it, I put a minus, I say minus quantity, I put quantity like this, and then I say times 71, variable cost per unit, times open bracket, 1 plus 0, 0.035, close bracket, to the power, shift 6, to the power N, which is my year, like this. I have my variable cost. I just drag and put to two decimal places, something like this. I can, I can even customize it to make it a number so that you can see that my variable costs, they are negative. Then fix the costs. Fix the costs are 3,000, but these ones are... They are already in thousands, so they are 3,000, 3,100, 3,200, but they are before inflation of 6%. So I equally do that. I just come to fix the costs here and I say fix the costs. I just say dash inflated. Inflated because I because these are not pay per unit, there's no need to multiply them by quantity. You take 3,000, inflate it by 6%. So it's like equals minus, because it's a cost, 3,000 times open bracket, 1 plus 0, 0,06, close bracket, to the power, which is 6, to the power, year. I punch my year like that. I now have my fixed costs. I drag them like this. Now, I acknowledge that fixed cost for year two was 3.1. So I come to the formula and change it to put 3.1. Fixed cost for year three was 3.2. I come to the formula and change it to 3.2. The cost for year, fixed cost for year four was 3,000, so I leave it like that because I've already put 3,000 for year 4. So in the interest of letting you see clearly that these are figures, let me put them in red. These are negative figures. 
Then I now have incremental costs. So these are my incremental costs. So this template tells me what to do next. After saying incremental sales, less incremental costs, are you not seeing that incremental costs are listed one by one? Fixed costs, variable costs, they are, we don't lump them together. If they are given separately, you calculate them separately. So in doing so, after I have, I have calculated incremental costs, I then have to, I then have to, have to cal to calculate pre-tax cash flows. It's there in the it's it's there in the template above. When you are cal calculating cash flows, you then say pre-tax cash flows. So pre-tax cash flows is basically the sum of all this. It's if if you can only add this up, that's your pre-tax cash flows. Like this, you drag it and you can observe my comma your comma here, and then. You say tax at 26%, tax at 26%. You are told that it is paid in the year of accrual here. Tax is 26%. So you come here and just say equals. You say, you come here and say equals minus 0.26 multiplied by the pre tax cash flow. Now, notice a very important thing. If tax was paid one year in arrears, when you're calculating tax for year one, year one, there would be nothing. You would come to year two and say equals minus 0.26 multiplied by, you then multiply by year one. If tax was paid one year in arrears, tax for year one, you would calculate it in year two. You say 26% of year one profit. Simple as that. But this time it's, it's paid in the year of approval. So I'm, I'm putting 0.26 multiplied by this uh, enter. So I drag like this, done. I put it in negative just for you to realize in red, in exam, there's no need to put it in red. I'm just putting it for expedience purposes for you to see. Then you say take Tax benefit on capital on capital allowances. Tax benefit on capital capital allowances. Allowances. So this one, let's let us have it as working one. If we can have it as working one, it will work, it, it, it will come out right for us. But let us proceed. In an exam, I, I expect you to proceed. You you come you come to it later. What else do we have? We have initial outlay. So the full initial investment is 20 million. This is the full initial investment, 20 million. So you come here and say initial outlay. Initial outlay. You put 20 million, but because your figures are in thousands, you put it at 20,000. All right. After getting your initial outlay like this, you then you then add the figures up, and what you get becomes net cash flow. You add the figures up, and you get net cash flow. Notice what you then get here is called net cash net cash flow net cash flow. So this is your net cash flow. So here's the deal. Net cash flow, you're now adding from profit through to this. There's no residual value. There's no working capital. So we ignored all that. So that these are your net cash flows. These are your net cash flows. So you have those net cash flows. Okay. Now we, we are left with one working. So you then say skip Skip, skip it. Skip three lines or four lines and say workings. Workings. And the working we want to do. Remember our lesson. We we finish our lesson at at six. So we are about to wrap it up. Don't worry. So remember your our working is tax benefit on capital allowances. So it's tax benefit benefit on 
capital allowances. Or we, we can call it capital allowances or tax allowable depreciation. You know that? Or TAD, tax allowable depreciation. That's what capital allow, that's the definition of capital allowances. TAD, tax allowable depreciation. So here's how you go about it. Listen, you say here, <clears throat> you say here, and you say, you, you start with, you start from year one, you say year, and then you, you drag it, year one, two, three, four, right? Then you say, tax base, tax base, it starts, remember, to say tax base, it's simply saying carrying amount, you know, when you are dealing with tax matters, you don't say carrying amount, you say tax base. But what it means is simply carrying amount. And then you say tax allowable depreciation at, they are saying capital allowances or tax allowable depreciation is 25% reducing balance. So tax base at start and then tax allowable depreciation at 25%. And then you get tax base at end at end. Now we have tax base at end. So you've got tax base at start, tax allowable depreciation, and tax base at the end. So what you then have to do now, tax base at start, it simply means carrying amount of the asset at start, which is 20,000. For year one, you bought it for 20,000. So that's the tax base at start, 20,000. And then capital allowances is, is equals 0 0.25 multiplied by 20,000. And then tax base at end equals it is start minus capital allowances. So this, you can drag your formula like this. Now, the, if it's reducing balance, it means the closing balance in year one is the opening in year two. That's what reducing means. You know, reducing balance, closing balance in year one becomes opening in year two and so forth through to year four. It means closing in year four, in year two it's opening. So I break my formula like this. Are you not seeing something? I, I, after, after I have gotten to this level, what I then do is I acknowledge the fact that I acknowledge the fact that, let me put this to two decimal places for you, for you to see what I'm talking about. After I have done this, I, I then do it this way. Notice, in the final year, let me understand this, in the final year, you look for the residual value. The examiner is saying it is zero residual value at the end of four years. So the capital allowance is for year four. You don't use the formula of saying 25% of opening balance. No. You put residual value here to say zero. And the capital allowances are, is the balancing figure. In, the, in year four, the capital allowances becomes this minus zero here. That becomes your capital allowance or tax allowable depreciation. Now you may say, say, what if the residual value was 400? You would do the same by putting 400 here. And the capital allowance will be the balancing figure. So in this case, it's zero. So I'm putting zero. And then this now, this one is just the balancing figure. You now understand this. So I can add a comment. If you don't mind again. Oh, sorry. I can, add, I can set a comment on this one to say the capital allowance for the final year is the balancing figure. The capital allowance, the, the TAD for the final year, let's say the tax allowable depreciation for the final year is the balancing figure. Balancing figure. It, the given residual value, residual value. So if they say the residual value is new, it means the given residual value is zero. If they, if they say it's 50, you put 50, if they say it's 10, you put 
obtain, you get that. So let me let me show that. Let 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 us show this particular comment like this. Let let us leave it there so that you'll be seeing it. Each time you are playing the video, you'll be seeing it. So the so remember what we are calculating. We are calculating takes allowable. I mean takes benefit. You then say takes. A tad multiplied by the tax rate, multiplied by 26%, tax benefit equals, you then say tax allowable depreciation multiplied by 0.26. This is how you calculate tax benefit on capital allowance. It is this line that we, we want, it is this line now that we want to put here. So we can now complete and say equals equals this it starts in here one remember so you can drag it like this and you have you have your 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 cash flows and now we are done now the question was calculate calculate npv nominal net present value i want you to understand this once you get to net cash flows you then say npv equals npv equals you you end at net cash flows and say NPV equals because your exam is computer based, you uh, you you do it on Excel and you are discounting with nominal cost of capital of twelve percent. So what you do is because nominal cost of capital is twelve percent, so you say NPV equals and you come here and say equals NPV. Pay attention equals NPV. Open brackets. NPV, then you open brackets and say, uh, and say, you put the rate first, which is 12%, and then you put a comma. Remember, not a full stop, but a comma. And then you highlight your values from year one through to year four, like this. Highlight values from year one through to year four. Close bracket. And then I, I now want to subtract the initial outlay, the 20,000. But because the 20,000 is negative and I want to subtract it, it will add. So if you want to subtract a negative number, you put a plus sign and then I add initial outlay. So my NPV is 33,463.16. That's my NPV. 33,463.16. Now, Kuzi, are you there? Yes sir. yes, sir. Can you repeat what I have said? I said, how do you calculate NPV? Uh, I was out uh, too, right? It's, it's, it's. Now, let me repeat it. Notice I'm repeating again. Okay. Can you mute your background noises? Uh, you say NPV equals notice what i do i say npv equals like this i come to another cell and say equals npv i open my bracket i then put my rate to say 12 percent that's my nominal cost of capital and then put a comma i then highlight the values from year one through to year four like this and close it i don't include year zero when i highlight the values I then close the brackets. And then I want to subtract initial outlay, but because initial outlay is negative, if I say minus a negative number, it will end. So what I do, I say plus the initial outlay like this. You now get it right? Yeah, I got it now. Okay, perfect. And then comment. What you have to comment now on what does this mean? You say the project is accepted, is, is acceptable, is acceptable since NPV, NPV is positive. Now, uh, now, uh, Kuzi, I want you to answer me question by, you know, question by question. With this approach, are you not seeing, we don't even use tables to find discounting factors? 
Are you getting it? Yeah, we do use uh, tables. In number one. Number two, are you not seeing that we end our calculation at net cash flow? We don't we don't discount to get present values. You just end at net cash flow and use your formula. Yes, yes. Good. This is this is because now that you are doing everything on a computer, on laptops and everything, there's no need to to what notice there's no need to do it in, in the manner we have put it in the cash flow template here to say these two lines are not necessary to say net cash flows and then you say <clears throat> discounting factors and then you say present values. This is done when you are doing manually when your exam is paper based. If your exam is paper based, that is that you do it. So because this video will be played for some who are doing paper based exams. Let me show you if you were doing paper based exam, how you were going to do it. So what I'm going to do here is to copy this up to net cash flow line. I copy it like this and then allow me to paste it on, on this side. Let me paste it like this. Paste. Uh, let me just paste the values, paste the special values like this. And then let me insert for the values to make sense like that, like this, like this, like this. So there you go. And let me put my figures in to two decimal places like this. Or actually, let me put them like this so that this, the negatives will be standing out. All right. So there you go. So if, if, you, if, you, if your exam was paper based, of which yours now is not for ACCA. You do come to net cash flows like this. After coming to net cash flows, like uh, you, you put a line, after getting your net cash flows, you would then say, you would then say present value interest factor, PVIF at 12%, PVIF at 12%, uh this is what what we mean by discounting factor so discounting factors you get them from tables so you do come to present value tables like these ones make sure you are at present value tables and you come to 12 percent this is your 12 percent now in year one is always zero i mean in year zero is one but in in year one you get from tables. You don't get here zero from tables. So you say 0, 0,893. So I come here and say 0, 0,893. Notice I am taking figures under 12%. In year two, 0, 0,797. 0, 0,797. 0, 0,797. In year three, taking figures under 12%, 0, 0,712. 0,712. In year four, taking figures under 12%, I have 0,636. 0,636. And then I discount these to get present values. So this is what the computer, the Excel has already done. So you say PV present values present values so you say equals this times the discounting factor to get present values so if you if i highlight everything these are present values and then i say npv equals sum of present values sum of pvs which is equals to so i come here and say equals sum open bracket I highlight my figures like this, close bracket, enter. So my NPV, if I use my manual setup, it's 33,472. If I use my Excel, it's 33,463. The reason is you can't have exact figure because the discounting values, the discounting factors here are rounded to three decimal places. So your answer can't be exact. But if you had used the formula, this part will not be necessary if you use the formula. So this part you ignore. 
If you were using the formula, the part in, in yellow, you ignore. All you simply do is you come there to net cash flows and say equals NPV, open bracket. You then put the rate 12, include the percentage sign, put a comma, and then highlight your figures like this from year one, not from year zero, close bracket, and then say plus initial outlay like this, enter, 33,463. This is because it does not use, it uses the full discounting factors without rounding them to the nearest three decimal places. That's the reason for the difference. It needs not to be exact, but your conclusion will still be the same. So this is merely for those who are going to, who have got a manual paper-based exam, who will actually make use of this particular video. But continuing with us as a CCA, for example, we only end our issues at net cash flow, and then you are done. Right. So let me tell you something that is so important. Let me tell you something that is important. We said nominal cash flow equals cash flow one one plus ir to the power n this is how you get nominal cash flow so it means if this means what it means is this means let me have it in, 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 in caps to know, to, for you to know that I am deducing it from what I've just said. This means then real cash flow, cash flow over, nominal cash flow over one, one plus, over one plus IR to the power shift six then to the power n so if you are given if you are given nominal cash flows you can get a real cash flow in this case ir we said is the general rate of inflation ir equals general general rate of inflation now in this case we now have a question which is saying Calculate a real NPV, meaning the same question there says, calculate the real NPV. Here, yeah, calculate the real NPV, just four marks. We already have nominal NPV. So if we, if we want to calculate a real NPV, it's easy. You make use of this relationship. So this relationship is important because it is going to guide what we are now going to do. So let us now say real NPV, real NPV. When you are calculating real NPV, you do the same procedure. You say, yeah, so you say, yeah, like this. Let me say, yeah, equals, uh, let me just link. I want to take the year, which is, uh, which is this one. So I, I get my years, year 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I have my years. If possible, I put it in board. And then, now that I have my years, I already have nominal cash flows. So I say, uh, I say nominal cash flows. Nominal, uh, nominal pre-tax, pre-tax cash flows. Notice, notice the cash flows that I take. I take pre-tax cash flows. Let me put the word pre-tax in bold. Nominal pre-tax cash flows. So the nominal pre-tax cash flows are like this. Why is it I take nominal pre-tax cash flows? It's because capital allowances or tax allowable depreciation, these ones are not inflated. Remember, tax allowable depreciation is not inflated. So if I want to use this relationship to say 
the real cash flows equals nominal cash flow over 1 plus r to the power n. I need you to understand that inflation ended on pre-tax cash flows. So if I take net cash flows, I am including capital allowances which are not inflated. So I must take pre-tax cash flows to avoid a situation where I am, I am now adjusting for inflation on tax allowable depreciation because tax allowable depreciation is based on cost. It is not inflated. So if I want to adjust my nominal cash flows to make them real, I come to pre-tax cash flows. So in this case, I use pre-tax cash flows. You now understand why. So pre-tax cash flows, I just come here and take the figures I have there. The figures I have there, they, it's, not, it's not even a train smash. Take them, take them here, copy them there. Okay, it's, it's, it's extending to year one, two, year one, two, three. Okay, there's year four. So I, I extend it to year four like that. That's, that's my pre-tax cash flows. And then what do I do next? I then say, you notice, if I have got nominal cash flows to, to get a real, I say nominal cash flow, real cash flow equals nominal cash flow over one plus R to the power N. It's coming from this equation. It's a matter of making real cash flow the subject of formula. You divide both sides by one plus R to the power N. So real cash flow equals nominal. And this is called a deflation index index or let me say inflation index for let me not use terms which may confuse you inflation index is the one plus r to the power n and r is the general rate of inflation so in this case the general rate of inflation is 3.7 percent so i come here and say the inflation index equals one plus 0, 0.037 close bracket to the power n. I, I, I then come and say equals 1 equals open bracket 1 plus 0, 0.037 close bracket to the power n. I link my n like that. Enter. So this is my deflation index or inflation index. Let me use the word that that that, that gives you comfort and you can give it to two decimal places this is still the same once you have done this the answer you get is called the real cash flow so this becomes real pre-tax cash flows real pre-tax cash flows so these are the real pre-tax cash flows so what are they i say equals Remember, I'm using the formula I'm dividing. So it equals this here, divide by this to get, divide by the, uh, sorry, equals that divided by this, enter. So these are now the real pre-tax cash flows before inflation. And then I continue and say tax, tax at 26%, tax at 26%. So I say equals minus 0.26, I'm now deflating 0.26 divided by this. I'm now calculating tax on this now going forward. And then I say tax benefit on capital allowances. Tax benefit on capital allowances. Tax benefit on capital allowances. These, I just take them as they are because they are not inflated. Notice we are putting them in year one for year one because we are told that tax is paid one year. I mean, in the year it accrues, it, it arises. If tax was paid one year in arrears, the benefit for year one, this 1.3, would be near two. The benefit for year two would be near three. And the benefit for year four would be near five. You push the years by adding another year on, on things that involve tax. Right? And then you say initial outlay 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 so initial outlay you have it is minus 20,000 and then so what you then have to do is you now have net cash flow net cash flow here now 
okay you now have your net cash flow so with your net cash flow line here net cash flow you just add from this don't add from nominal nominal we just put there to calculate real and we have done that so we are done you are adding from pretext drag to the end and then put to two decimal places and then say npv equals skip a line and say a real npv equals a real n pv pv here and say equals notice equals n pv open bracket and then you because it's now real you use the real cost of capital which is eight percent so you come here and say eight percent eight percent you put a comma not full stop comma and then you highlight the values from year one through to year to the final year you close and then you you want to subtract initial outlay meaning year zero cash flow but year zero cash flow is negative to subtract a negative number you add that like this then you are done so real cash flow becomes 33,847. i mean the real npv and then you comment and say the project the project is acceptable the project is acceptable because npv is positive the project is acceptable since real NPV positive. You get that? Now, if you were doing online, I mean paper-based, you would proceed like what we have done uh, here, where I was illustrating to say you would then use discounting factors of 8% here. Instead of 12, you would go to tables and pick 8% and proceed. Uh, is what we have done here but with eight percent so let me now wrap it up as in telling you how do you get real npv when you are given nominal cash flows first go to pre-text cash flows in your nominal npv working the reason why we don't go to net cash flows is because net cash flows include tax allowable depreciation which were not inflated. Remember, tax allowable depreciation is based on cost of the asset. So we don't go to net cash flows. We go to pre-tax cash flows because these are all based on figures which have been inflated. And then you deflate those nominal cash flows using this deflation factor. The equation goes like nominal cash flow equals the real cash flow bracket one plus inflation to the power n. So if you if you are given nominal and you want real, you make real the subject of formula. So it becomes nominal cash flow bracket one plus, or I mean over one plus r to the power n. So over means divide, and I r here is the general rate of inflation. It is not. Remember, we are given quite a lot of inflation rates. We are given inflation on sales here, inflation on variable cost here, inflation on fixed cost here, but when we are Calculating real, we use general rate of inflation. In this case, general rate of inflation is given as 3,7%. So, no wonder why our figures here, we were using 0,037. And then, another way to calculate real net NPV, you can just do it from the start to put units and stuff, but you just use these selling prices and variable costs as they are without inflation. Let me repeat. Another way was to ignore inflation altogether because when you are doing a real, you ignore inflation. So another way was to another way was to cancel the inflation thing. If we if you are calculating real, another way which does not involve you going to nominal pre-tax cash flows is to do NPV afresh, but you use these cash flows as they are and ignore anything to do with inflation. And then 
you make sure you discount with a real cost of capital. You still get the same answer. That was another way of doing it. We were going to just use selling prices as they are, variable costs as they are, fixed costs as they are, without inflating them. But you'll be multiplying by number of units, of course. And then tax allowable depreciation. Now, tax allowable depreciation is not inflated, whether you are using nominal or you are using a real. I mean, tax benefit on capital allowances. We don't inflate it, whether it's nominal or whether it's a real. And then you do that. But one last thing is, if the cash flow, if the, ca if the real cost of capital was not given, you were going to use the Fisher equation, this Fisher equation to get it. If the real cost of capital was not given, you were going to use the Fisher equation to get it. To say one plus nominal equals one plus R because the real is not given. So you leave it as R. Then you say bracket one plus zero comma zero three seven, which is the general rate of inflation. So it will be one plus zero comma one two, which is nominal, equals one plus R, the real that you are looking for, times one plus zero comma zero three seven. So the equation then simplify as one comma one two equals you say open bracket one plus r because you are you are finding r then you multiply that by one comma zero three seven and then you simplify it by saying one plus r equals you then say one plus r equals you then say one comma one two over one comma zero three seven you get the answer is 1,08. Then R, your real rate then becomes a, uh, your real rate becomes 1,08 minus 1 to make to find R, which is equals to 8%. This is the 8% which the examiner has calculated for you, 8%. If it was not calculated, you were going to perform this working that we have done here to get the 8%. Is it making sense, Kudzi, for that, for on that part? Yes, it makes sense. Yes, that's what, that is what you were, you, were, you, were, you were going to do. So on that note, uh, you, know, you know what, uh, for those who will play the, this particular, if you, if you are going to play this particular video, it, everyone in this class should subscribe to your sales YouTube, account, YouTube channel